shoulders and we came oh. around the corner and we were like like looking at each other <laughs> you're like and i start to like yes you know. <laughs> yeah it was like this freaky moment and uh he goes in this like gravelly voice well i guess we have to be friends now and it was just kind of funny <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This is another episode of the Scoped Exposure podcast. Um, I think to set the tone and the theme of this episode, sometimes you go to a fest in another part of the world and you meet someone that you might have seen online or like, you know, just seen stuff through their bands and uh, you hit it off immediately. And despite maybe not running into that person uh, for years to come, they still leave an impact on you. And that's um, why I wanted to bring... Uh, today's guest on the podcast um, plays in an awesome band uh, down from you know Texas and Oklahoma, a little bit of a hybrid. So, without further ado, please welcome Flint of Life Force on the show. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for the intro. That's really nice. Absolutely. Um, I think even like further back, I think the the latest uh, record that Life Force put out was in 2020 in the midst of all the craziness of the world. And I think I'm not sure I think I want to give you guys the I want to believe that it wasn't like shamelessly plugged or sent my way. I think I just discovered it in the midst of like just searching for new music as a part of, you know, scoped traditionally is really known for filming a lot of shows but like when there's no show just to film i had to adapt so i was just on the hunt to make cool playlists and life force was something that caught my ear immediately and i think that's how we started the the relationship and then obviously meeting at prom in 2021 um but yeah i think you reached out about talking about uh your your recent europe run so i was like let's absolutely do that i think I think this has been a long time coming for me personally, so I'm very happy to finally have you on, bro. Well, same, yeah. And it was, yeah, I think we had, I think we had connected like in 2020, um, we did the the um, Hope and Defiance release. And I think we had talked because you were in the process of getting off the ground with your band. And I think it was, I think I didn't connect that you were the same guy. Mm, like yes. I thought I, I associated you with your music as opposed to your podcast. So it was, and then when I saw, <laughs> then I saw you in Oklahoma and I was like, Oh shit. Okay. Like it mm. connected at that point. So yeah. yeah. So, anyway. Sometimes it, it catches people off guard that I can be a little bit of a, like I can transform myself into like, Oh, I'm the guy on stage filming. Oh, now I'm the guy on stage playing guitar. And now, yeah. now, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I want to give a special shout out to, to Cayman from strangle you. Cause uh, act like you know fast like um which is which was prom core where we first met he uh right. he came up to me and my band was playing that year and sunny was filming and came and came up to me he's like you came to rock not record and that helped get me <laughs> in the perfect mood for the rest of the weekend so um dude yeah. he actually it's funny that you mentioned him because at, at the uh the year that you're talking about um he i had never met him either and um we've been like tangentially connected through like common friends or whatever and um but we just had never met and he came over to the table and he was like hey flint right and i was like yeah and he was like i just want to say um congrats on on uh getting your new place man i saw it on on facebook that looks really nice and he like shook my hand i was like thanks like i was like oh that was really nice and he walked away and uh, my homie that was sitting with me at the merch table was like who was that and i was like uh, he he plays in a band and like we've kind of been internet connected for a minute but like I, we've never met in person he was like that was the most like real, like, uh, you know, genuine little interaction I've seen in a long time. And I was like, yeah, it was really cool. So it's like, right. that was just like a really lovely, now, like, little, like, yo, that record. Moment so of sick. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like congrats on no that cloud. tour. It's like, Oh, yeah. you're a homeowner dabs up. <laughs> yeah. Right. It was like, it was just this nice, like, like human moment of like two people that weren't hardcore kids just being like, nice to meet you. I was like, yeah. Oh, you right. Know. 
yeah if you you yeah. strip the music aside it's it's very wholesome either way but i think having the hardcore at aspect also makes it very wholesome um it's only i don't know it's funny to think about because when people think about like backflips and hardcore all obviously like gotta pay respect <laughs> to seb from regulate but cayman is definitely one of those so there almost needs to be a tour package that just has front men and front women that can just pull off the dopest backflip i would love to yeah, see that like, personally yeah just the the backflippers u.s full u.s backflippers run that'd be badass <laughs> yes. I, I will not be joining that run neither my will i ass. will, <laughs> yeah. will not be attempting this <laughs> um so uh backflips and uh hardcore side uh before we get into the rest of this convo flint we have to check some bevs so i'm very excited to hear oh, what yeah. you've got and what you're bringing to the episode Right. Yeah. So um, I'm glad that I did a little like, um, you know, research and kind of like, okay, what am I in for? Um, you Before we, you know, hit record, you were like, this is not a gotcha podcast. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm not going to get put on the spot or whatever. But I was like, okay, I definitely have to have like, you know, something worthwhile. I can't just have like a bottle of water or something. Right. So, um, okay. So first um, I have to shout out uh, Youth Energy, uh, my homie, Chris. Um, he does a uh, little label called Dog Years Records that was like instrumental um, in Life Force actually getting on the radar of New Age. Um, we were asked to be on a comp um, in 2019, and um, he was, you know, awesome about like, you know, helping us put together, um, you know, all the plans for that. And then he did the art for um, Hope and Defiance. Um, and that's probably what caught your eye was like the hand with the X behind uh -huh. it and stuff because we well, wanted to be real classic. Right. And, you know. and, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you, you know this, but like youth energy and scoped are like, they're big fans of one another, oh. I think. Okay. Uh, excellent. I didn't even okay, know cool. that he did the artwork for that, but like, I literally, this morning I was picking a shirt. I almost grabbed, I have a youth energy, uh, Calvin and Hobbes rip that says it's, Sick. it's cool to ignore the haters on the back, but I've, I've got plenty of stuff. I have like the sam raimi spider-man um flag just right there like um i i've actually Dude, been trying to get chris shit. on the pod for for a minute but i know he's moving and things are busy right now so and he's like mr busy like he's always <laughs> got shit cooking all the time so yeah mm -hmm. but i just want to shout him out um i'm drinking my morning coffee. it's like the dregs of my morning coffee okay um i don't know if you can see it but uh oh actually i guess i should show this side first i don't know if you saw this he did like a limited my friends drop. had caffeine is <laughs> And then on the back, it says, tell your friends, I love that. fuck you. Yes. Uh, so he did those. And uh, when it came up, I uh, legitimately immediately logged on and bought. I was like, it was one of the only drops of any merch, let alone his merch, that I was like, I cannot let miss this. Because that right. is like, you know, the immortal quote for anyone who's straight edge that happens to enjoy coffee or whatever. So Yeah, it, it seems like every six months, some person has some like weird take on twitter about it and Dude, every in droves time. in droves people come it's in. straight up every single year at least once a year since i've been involved in like the online hardcore community like so like all the way back to message boards like 2005 era right and it's every year like clockwork some new jack asshole is like well actually every fucking it's like <laughs> clockwork man, i swear so anyways yeah that's one bev uh the second is um it's open, but I have not taken a sip, but um, it is a uh, a Celsius sparkling orange. Nice choice. So, nice choice. Yeah, yeah. Can't beat it. Yes. I'll um, be very sufficiently caffeinated for the call. <laughs> sufficiently, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I can hear the clicks of the one or two people that think caffeine is a drug. You know, like, okay, yeah, right. I'm out, I'm out. Um, I'm roasting this motherfucker right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, it's good because um, – I, I had a very, for Bev's for me, I had a very late edit night. Um, there's a lot of like um, specific scope projects that are kind of coming down the pipe. Um, and uh, I, you know, sometimes when you have your first cup of coffee in the morning and it, you hit the last sip and you're like, I want to, I, I can't even have a anything. break. Like we need to keep this yeah. shit going. So I, I did yeah, another yeah. AeroPress and I'm fully topped up as well. So excellent excellent yes. yeah it's like it hits your stomach and immediately it just turns into it's just eviscerated like there is there's no effect yeah You're like, cool at, at the end of this episode movie. maybe shitting out the wazoo but you know we'll uh <laughs> we'll we'll get to that point um so flint <laughs> cheers to you and cheers to all the people that think caffeine is not a drug <laughs> thank you very much yeah 
Um, so Flint, I'm, you know, like you said, you've done a little bit of research. Uh, I'm sure there's been a lot of mutuals that might have been on the pod. You may might have listened to one or two of these. So I always like to start every new person who's been on the pod just to get a little bit of context about how they even got on the path that they're on. So talk to me about the first time you heard hardcore punk DIY, however you want to spin it. You're, so this is, I was, yeah, I was dreading like the show your age question and I'm glad we're getting it like out of it, like, <laughs> like right away. So, um, I, uh, I went to high school. So we were talking about a little bit before we like hit record. Um, we were talking about act like, you know, fest formerly known as prom core. Um, so that's my home scene is the Oklahoma hardcore scene. And, um, my family moved from rural Kansas, like central Kansas to, uh, Oklahoma City metro area uh, when I was in high school. And um, so I had always been a skater and I had been into, you know, like skate punk type stuff. And I I liked, and actually, uh, if you look at like my eighth grade, um, you know, like bio sheet, we filled out these bio sheets before our eighth grade graduation. And um, it's like favorite music is like AFI and Taking Back Sunday. And so it's like, I was like tangentially connected to hardcore, but had never heard the term and didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to this new high school and um, obviously, you know, like when you start at a new high school, like as a sophomore or a junior, it's like, you're already kind of starting with like, you don't know anyone and it's hard to kind of break into those social groups or whatever. And um, our lockers were split lockers. So we had like, you would have a neighbor below you or above you, depending on like where your name fell in the alphabet. Right. Okay. And, um, I randomly by chance got paired up with this guy named Grant and I always shout Grant out. So Grant Redfern, he's now just like a regular dad somewhere um, living. I think he lives in Oklahoma still, but maybe Colorado, but he's just like a normie. So uh, like, honestly, it's like, it's kind of a funny like turn of events. But anyway, at this time, you know, I was like still into, you know, like the blink 182s and green days of the world, but really didn't have much exposure to anything like, I guess, like counterculture or anything like that. And um, he always wore AFI shirts. He was like a member of the AFI fan club. And so he had like the real old, like a fire inside merch. Oh, and okay. I remember being yeah. like, that's cool. Cause I knew who they were, you know? And I, so we chatted a little bit about music um, and um, he would wear like throwdown t-shirts and terror t-shirts to school and stuff. And um, the throwdown shirts at that time were really like, I don't want to say like inflammatory, but like kind of extreme they like one of them had like a knife in the back of the shirt and um it was like a <laughs> dripping knife from being shot sure. in the back yeah, yeah. and like you know it's like stuff like that and um so finally you know my my locker was above his so i would you know if he was kneeling at his locker i would kind of have to come up, up over his shoulders and be like sorry bro or whatever and get my shit yeah and um i was looking at this insane shirt he had on and finally i was like what is what is this throwdown shirt that you always have on like you have a bunch of different shirts of this is a band and he was like actually i'll uh, i'll show you what are you doing this weekend and i was like i don't have any plans he was like my mom will take us to a show and so his mom took us in her minivan to um this venue in oklahoma city it doesn't exist anymore but uh, it was called the green door and um it was throwdown and they were on tour for um i think it was haymaker they were mm. they were touring supporting haymaker and i had never that was like the first time i had seen anything like that and like to be exposed in that way it was just this like holy shit like where am i like who are mm -hmm. these dudes you know and like it was people beating the snot out of each other or whatever you know so it was this like deep end exposure that um mm -hmm. you know never looked back at that point so um that was my first i guess i think that's like a long roundabout answer but that was my that was my first exposure to the world of hardcore yeah man the serendipity of like seeing the shirt and like you know maybe he didn't maybe he was like me maybe he was close to not wearing it that day and he wore another shirt and then like you asked a, a week later and they were like oh they were just here you know like uh, yeah right exactly yeah and it's funny because me. there was this other dude who was a transfer um in in our school he transferred from Tulsa and I would always see him in the hallways wearing merch and shit. And um, we would always kind of like give each other the nod, but we didn't know each other, you know, and, and our school was huge. It was like 4,000 kids or something. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, you didn't see everyone every day. And um, later, um, it would have been like two years later. So it was like right after graduation, I ended up playing music with that guy. Um, he played drums in um, several multiple um, Oklahoma hardcore projects that I did that was my first exposure to touring and like playing nationally and stuff. 
And um, that guy and I went to high school together and we weren't friends. Like we didn't know each other. So it's just it's really strange. Like it's, it's, it seems like a small world and like you would know everyone, but man, it's like, it's really not. I mean, you mm-hmm. have to really, you do have to be brought in. So it's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. It, or at least I, then you did, I guess it was pre-social media, right? So it's yeah. Like, well, yeah, that's, a, that is a big p- p- point of it. But I do think also it's like, it's very easy nowadays. Like you could open your phone and just one clip of a band playing in a super DIY spot is, is exploding and putting it onto new people. You see which, scoped exposure on YouTube and you're like, dang, this is cool. What am I missing yeah, out on? Yeah, yeah. I didn't have that luxury. So yeah. But like, I think that like maybe just like starts the breadcrumb trail, but I do think, I think it's um, props to this friend of yours for, uh, you know, this weekend, you know, maybe we'll like go over to my house and maybe listen to it on, you know, CD or, you know, my task cam or whatever, but like right. just going straight to like the show experience, because I- I've said it multiple times before, like the show, like feeling the energy in the room to me is what galvanizes like yes. someone's interest who's like really about it. You know, there yeah, might be right. someone who's I mean, like, well, like- this is crazy, but then like, you know, maybe they're not meant to be in the scene forever but i think for people that are like on that path and they're in their first couple of steps that's what really seals the deal in my opinion yeah i agree i think that you know there are like now there are you see a coachella lineup get announced and you see a a name like knocked loose or scowl and it's like that's a it's a good way for like you know people who have complete no initiation in any way to start that process or whatever right but knowing those folks and and having gone to those shows like you don't get the same vibe the same experience or anything from listening to scowl online watching a scowl video and then being the crowd at a scowl set right i mean it's like not at remotely the same experience so i think yeah i agree with you completely it's funny though because that at that time i was already playing music with like other like weirdos but they were like non-punk weirdos you know so it was this like you know, we didn't really know what we were doing. Like we knew about, you know, bands on Victory Records, but we didn't know about the history of Victory Records. type. Vibe. Right. And so, yeah, like we're playing, you know, like weird music and we're playing VFW shows and stuff, but it was, so it was DIY, but it was like accidental, you know, like mm-hmm. non-punk DIY vibes. And then, you know, at, yeah, like after social media has taken off and it's allowed for that, I think that process is easier now, which is a good thing. I'm not one of these assholes in hardcore that's like, I had to walk 15 miles both ways uphill (laughs) bullshit. Like, I'm like, no, that's cool. Like the more people that are into good shit with smart messages, it's like, that's a good thing. We should Mm -hmm. encourage that shit. Yeah. And I think the example, uh, what you're saying with knock loose and in, in Coachella and and scowl, like the two things that I think of in that is like, you know, Isaac's been on the podcast, like this season fairly recently and his, like the whole like mantra with that band is like play the bigger ass shows that the the norm isn't hardcore kids going to it and then bring them to a headliner and then bring them to a local show that we're not even playing you know it's like kind of right like yeah. system and it's not just like every single person that sees knock loose at coachella this year is gonna fuck with it a and b right they might not yeah. they might be like oh that was crazy but they might not go to a headlining event where they're bringing out other hardcore bands but um sure you know, I think the, you know, it's about, it's the same thing. It's like, I have, you know, 8,000 followers on Instagram, roughly as far as the time we're recording this. I know that not every single Flex, person is going to, okay. not trying to, but uh, just, <laughs> you know, spin facts. Um, yeah, right, but, right, right. But like that to me helps remind me off of like, you know, there are people that are like soft to it. They're like diehard fans. So you have to kind of be like, um, you know, smart about that where, you know, them playing that I think is a is a it's a base hit for the hardcore scene to be able to bring all these potentially new people to a headliner show. And then, you know, there might be one person that starts a huge ass band in five years. Um, and the thing that I think about in that like realm is is like you see a lot of hate of like, oh, you know, they're rock stars now or whatever. Not necessarily, but I haven't seen that about Knocked Loose, but uh, like with the the hype that has gone on around that new Turnstile record, the new West Turnstile record, and then like watching their like meteoric explosion into yeah. like actual fame, you know, mm-hmm. um, you see like bad attitude takes on that. Um, and the way I look at that is like, they're playing music 
that you know allows them to to do that in a professional way and like that regardless of whether or not you think it's like cool or you think it's legit like if one kid that was like struggling with the shit that ev- you know everybody's drawn to hardcore for like basically the same three reasons or same handful of reasons and if one person at you know is in rural fucking Oklahoma and hears that record and then that draws him to a community where he's like oh shit i'm not you know drudging through life every day completely alone and there is a community for me like dude you can't shit on that like that's the value in that even if it works one time that's good that's mm-hmm. that's enough like that's enough justification to be like well cool you know as long as they're not these bands not calling out anyone in particular but as long as they're not like just completely abandoning you know, all their prior stances and messaging or whatever, then like Mm -hmm. more power to them. Like, how can you shit on that? Yeah, I think like anything creative, like obviously like looking at the numbers and seeing like, okay, like how can we um, realistically scale whatever we're doing? And that could be a band, that could be a podcast, could be whatever. But I've always liked the idea of like the, like the one person that I really affect with a certain episode or a project that I'm doing or like a show that I'm playing, um, you know, and to me, that means more to have it where it's not like, oh, I put out this episode with Flint and it's going to affect like there will be hundreds, yeah, right. if not thousands of people that might listen to it over the years to come. But like if it really affects one person, that's all I that to me is worth, you know, the two hours that we're going to spend here. Um, yeah, I think that needs to be the fo- I think that um kind of mindset may be a little bit lost on people who like we talked about like pre-social media Mm -hmm. life where it was like the only time you could hear these types of messages like the only time you could hear that on stage um you know i i don't want to say banter but you know messaging that is so you know unique for hardcore and and at least should be in my opinion should be like a priority for hardcore bands Mm -hmm. um you had to go to the show for that shit yeah. And so like, you know, if you, if you can, I guess, replicate that, um, you know, that process of, of getting those messages translated to more and more ears Oh, my cat's saying hello, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, that that's never going to be a bad thing. And that's, we actually had that conversation multiple times in Europe because there was at every single show, literally like we would finish playing and sometimes it would be before we would get off stage or if it would be like at the merch booth after or whatever but every single night of the show whether of the tour whether it was like you know the bigger shows or the smaller shows i had people come up and be like hey i just wanted to say like this kid came up to me at uh, one of our french shows and was like i drove five hours for this gig uh because your record was like the soundtrack to me choosing to go sober and it like it's more important to me than I can like really say and he was there like three and a half hours early kind of like standing alone like he drove like five hours by himself one way mm. for the, and I was just like dude you have no like the whole tour has been worth it for this this interaction for me like right. that's that's an incredible like it's a little overwhelming for me because it's also like, Jesus Christ, that's like a lot to hear, but it's like a lot in the right ways. you know. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think like that, that is very special. And I think again, that audience of one mentality where it's like, it might just be like, Oh, it's just another show. Like for someone like you or I, cause you're over 30, not to call you out, but like, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) I, I, I only ask cause I just turned 30, like a few, a few weeks ago, but, um, that that mentality of like for me it's like oh yeah just another gig on the calendar and whatever and like i might be stoked about the lineup and the venue or whatever but like i'm always thinking about the one person where it's their very first show and it's like yeah what is what what part do i want to play to making that experience really good leaving a lasting impact on them so you know not so they're guaranteed to come back but at the very least it's highly plausible that they had a good time and they do. Cause again, it's like, you know, those things for you where, you know, Throwdown might be like, Oh, we're going to play Oklahoma. Like, do you know, right. should we add that to the tour? But like now we wouldn't be sitting here doing that. So like, I love to play on those curiosities and, and, and uh, 
and just really like let things play out because sometimes we don't see the um the impact of our of our efforts and our labor until much later on yeah i saw some some you know of course because we're talking about hardcore i saw some twitter discourse yesterday um that there was like somebody from outside the hardcore scene was like what is the deal? My cat is like really insistent. <laughs> it's almost like there's a, a a conveyor I, belt off the video and it's just bringing your I'm, cat in. It just over and over. He just keeps coming over and, and like bothering me. Can you go on? Um, I saw this, you know, comment on Twitter that was like, I don't know what the deal is with these hardcore guys, but they take themselves entirely too seriously, which I'm like, is probably a fair criticism in a lot of ways. Um, I know it is for me, um, but also, I mean, there is a, a layer of like seriousness or like realness to the scene that it doesn't exist in other genres and it doesn't exist in other genres like for a reason, like it's, we still, the genre still has its soul in a way that others don't. And it's because like that effect of like the crowd of one of like, he was right place, right time, or she just happened to get invited or they were like brought by their cousin or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, that crowd of one heard the right thing at the right time that potentially saved their lives or potentially made them go vegan or whatever, like the the messaging is. Mm -hmm. And it's like that, that is worth, you know, being pretty serious about that is like, there's a lot of value there. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, on the flip side of that, being the person that the that kid comes up to and is like, Hey, I just want to say thank you for this. I'm like, dude, that's for me. I'm like, I don't need, I don't give a shit about like the record sales. I don't give a shit about like if, whether or not we're playing the cool fests or whether or not we're playing, you know, like the cool tours or whatever, like that is all I need. Like I'm good with that and a day job. I'm happy. Like Mm -hmm. that's all I need. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's very important to like, to think about it, I think about it in a way where it's like you're just pulling from opposite directions. So obviously there's like the people that that might really want to like not scrutinize as a strong word, but be very critical about different things that are changing because they're being protective of something that's been so um, important in their lives and has like some like it, it is their lifestyle. It is what they do. And right. so they take it very, very seriously. At the same token, we both know that like there's a lot of things in hardcore and even just the idea of like a bunch of people like climbing on top of one another just to scream into one singular microphone. There, there's a lot of like corniness and goofy nature to it. But... In the dorkiness, as I like to say. Yes, yeah. exactly. So I think it's like being able because you've seen people that only lean to one or only lean to the goofy side. And I think you have to kind of be you know spider-man um pulling the train and like you know doing that but uh yeah and obviously there's there's times to be able to lean to one side or the other depending on the context but i I think you need to have the balance of both for sure yeah i agree with you yeah we're on the same page yes um so talk to me about life force so you guys dropped your demo in 2018 um and you know the new record came out in 2020 and it's been a minute since new music has um come out so let's start at the very beginning as far as why that project came together like was it a you know a few bands breaking up and then reforming talk to me about that yeah so um it's kind of funny. I had, um, I'd played music a little bit. Um, like I said, like people that I knew from high school days or whatever. Um, and we had, we had a band in Oklahoma and that we played some shows and got like a really good response. Um, and we were like, we should tour. And, you know, we'd never, like none of us ever had ever done that before. And so we were, it was this kind of like baby steps moment where we were like, okay, well, like, how do we figure out getting a van? And I like spent like, student loan money on buying like a 1970s like Ford Econoline van with like shag carpet in it and shit. Oh, and wow. like, I'm like still <laughs> I'm like still paying off that student loan and I'm like I keep thinking about I'm like really good choice at the time but anyway it's like <laughs> like uh you know it's like you make these decisions and you're like all right we're gonna go and we're gonna play all over the country and so that that band was called Stay um and so we had s-t-a-y and it, we had like merch that was like you know stay straight edge and we thought that was so clever and funny mm. and whatever and so we um we ended up touring well our bassist couldn't go and so um i at the time i've i've since like gone to college and i'm um 
I'm in the bookstore one day and I'm walking through the bookstore and I remember this is, this is important. I talk a lot, so sorry, but there, this is an important part of the story. So I'm wearing a dead hearts t-shirt and it's just like a black shirt and it says DH on it, like big letters, um, a, uh, shipwreck trucker hat that's backwards, um, camo shorts and vans. And I have like a Chrome, like messenger bag on right with like a seat so like the hardcore tony hawk randomized uh, yeah, the yeah, outfit uh, kind of thing <laughs> yeah right 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 yeah like i mean it was like what two, i think it was 2008 or 2009 sure. so yeah, I mean, yeah. it's like exactly you know i was really on trend at that point right? <laughs> yes so, uh, i uh i come around the corner in this bookstore and i'm looking at a dude in front of me who's blonde who's tattooed who is wearing a black t-shirt with gb like a grill biscuit shirt like big gb on the chest with the exact same chrome messenger bag with a backwards <laughs> black <laughs> trucker hat the exact same like fatigue cutoffs and the exact same vans on and but it was like mirrored like we had them on opposite shoulders and we came around oh. the corner and we were like like looking at each other <laughs> you're like and i start we, to like yes you know. yeah it was like this <laughs> freaky moment and uh he goes in this like gravelly voice well, I guess we have to be friends now. And it was just kind of funny, <laughs> like funny moment where I was like, what are the fucking odds that, you know, me and this random dude like bump into each other in the bookstore. And so we walk outside, we check out with our, our textbooks for the year or whatever. And uh, we walk outside, go to the bike rack where our two fucking fixed gear bicycles are chained up right next to each other too. And they're like the same style. And we're just like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, dude, like what is happening? And we literally have been friends since that day. Um, and I find out, like, we go eat lunch together. And he's like, yeah, I've been vegan for 12 years or whatever. And I'm like, whoa, you know, because I, you know, I'm not. At that time, I wasn't. Well, we have was one this, difference. <laughs> yeah, right. It was this, like, wow. I was like, wow, this guy is, like, really an OG. And he was, like, in his, I think he was in his, like, mid-20s at that point. And that dude ended up being Matt Fletcher from Shy Halud. And so oh, wow. we okay. were. And he's from Oklahoma, which I didn't know. And he had just moved back. They just finished like a giant international tour. And um, the reason that he, I, I guess he felt comfortable enough to chat was not just because I was obviously a hardcore kid, but because they had just finished a run with Dead Hearts. And he was like, ah, homies with those guys. I see. And so do you wait, like, did you buy that shirt at? whatever local show that happened on that tour or was it just it, it was a dead hearts show yeah but it oh, wasn't okay. it wasn't with halud i had i'd only seen halud at one point before that um and i think it was with trash talk in kansas so it was okay. this it was like way before that but anyways it was like this weird happenstance thing well the reason i bring all that up is because stay we wanted to do national tours we wanted to you know like start out going through the southwest up the west coast Mm -hmm. you know, back around like through Colorado, Salt Lake into the Midwest, and then finally the East Coast, and then back around to Texas and Oklahoma. So it's like long thing, right? Yeah. And um, our bassist couldn't do it. Well, I just met the bassist in like a real band who has all his own gear, who is like very down to tour. And so I just like, randomly kind of pitched it to him. I was like, would you want to like, come fill in for us? And like, play bass in my little shitty straight edge band that you filled with people you don't know. And he was like, yeah, to his credit. Dude, wow. You're not, you're not a part of this. <laughs> um, we need dude, a, a counter as far as how many times you enter. Yeah. Story. Maybe uh, honestly. Yeah. Maybe you need to have like a cat check too. That would be <laughs> a cat <funny> check. <laughs> my, I, I don't, I have a dog check. They're, they're both sleeping and I'm trying to l keep it that way uh, versus trying yeah. to hold them up. But uh, yeah, cat check is, I think, is something that I think Yoda's have. thing is when he sees me, I'm usually when I'm in here working, I'm not talking to like, I'm not animated. I'm just right. sitting in one, you know? So he's yeah. like, what's going on over here? What are we doing? Yeah. yeah, anyway. yeah. <laughs> um, but Fletcher came and he came on that tour and um, then he ended up being on all of our tours because our bassist ended up could like never go because mm -hmm. he was like a manager for Apple, blah, 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 blah. And so, um, we became good buddies and we're still friends. Well, stay split up and everything. I, you know, I finished school, he finished school, he starts a family and he lives in Oklahoma full time now. And he has like, you know, this beautiful family that he started and he's basically got this, I, this idea for a project. Like at that point it was way down the line. It was like 2000, the end of 2017. And he was like, he hit me up and he was like, okay, hear me out. And that's like, he talks like a cartoon character. So, and I, I make sure to do his voice when I tell the story, but he was like, hear me out. I got this idea. 
for a project that'll be chain of strength, but darker and Damn. modern. And I was just kind of like, that sounds kind of cool. Like, what are you, you know, what are you thinking about doing with it? Because like, I'm a working adult now and I don't like have the time to really hit the road or whatever. And he was like, no, 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 no. It'll just be a studio project. Like we'll find someone to play drums. We'll, I'll play all the guitar parts and the bass parts and you just do vocals and it'll just be for fun. And I was mm. like, okay, cool. So like, I'm down for that. And uh, we record the demo. And I think it was just he and I um, at that point. And John, the drummer was his homie in Oklahoma. Who's like, he's an unbelievable drummer. And he basically, I, I think Fletcher was just kind of like belly aching and like, I just can't find anyone that, you know, that I feel like would be a good fit or that is interested or has the time. And John was like, well, I'll record your demo for you. And then you can use that to recruit someone. And um, his, he's so good that I was like, can this guy just play the drum parts? You know, like, can he just join? And so anyway, that's how he joined. And hmm. anyway, so we did the demo, we, we put it out and um, that led to attention from Blind Rage Records in Ohio, like small one person or two, two person DIY label. Um, and they wanted to put out a seven inch, which then put us on the radar of Chris and, um, Chris put out the comp, which put us on the radar of new age. And, um, it just kind of was like this really no effort involved, um, natural organic, like, like as a teenager, all I wanted was to like play music, have people care enough to put out vinyl, be able to play shows or whatever. And it was like this grind, like to struggle and like, no matter what I do, nobody seems to give a shit or whatever. Mm. And, you know, the idea of like, maybe my music was like, not all that cool, never crossed my mind, of course. Like it was always this like, yeah, we just can't get a break or whatever. And uh, it was like, when it happened with Life Force, it was just like, there was no effort. It was like the most organic, like, oh, I heard it. I like it. I want to put it out. Oh, I heard that. I like that. I want to put it out. I heard that. I like that. And it's just kind of continued since then. So um, the most recent thing is we remastered that first seven inch um, that Blind Rage originally put out um, and New Age put it out as an official New Age release because it never got like a large scale international release. Right, right. And um, again, like sort of the same thing. We get this random DM and it's um, Scott who he plays in Tooth and Claw and Earth Crisis. He plays guitar. Mm -hmm. And um, he was like, I want to work with you guys. So like, if you have anything that you guys need done, like mixing and mastering wise with new material or old material, like I want to, and it's like, if you had like, you know, gone back to teenage me and told me that I'd be like, get the fuck out of here. Like, there's no way. <laughs> right. So it's just like this a natural, another, again, like another chapter in that like natural progression type story, because it was just like, yeah, we could re-release that seven inch. And so he remixed it and remastered it. And new age re-released it on multiple new colors and so that came out in 22 or like re came out in 22 mm -hmm. and that's what spurred the the euro trip um because we had had um three european tours booked prior um that covid ruined two of them and then ukraine ruined the third one. Oh, okay and we were like we're just it's never gonna happen at this point like mm -hmm. it, it it just keeps getting ruined. And it was with these big names that were like, we were really looking forward to these trips. And it's like names like suicidal and sick of it all and agnostic front and hate breed. And so we're like, these things would happen. They'd get announced. They flyers would get made. Facebook events would get made, you know, all this shit. And then never mind, it's all canceled. And so we were like really demoralized. And, um, this time around, it just happened to work out. And, um, you know, Stay True helped us get the shows put together. It's a booking agency over there. And um, it just finally happened. So we were kind of doing this tour in support of that record. And um, that's kind of caught us up from demo era to now. So yeah, it's kind of yeah. Fun. And, and the storytelling aspect is, is very on point. Um, but yeah, it, it's <laughs> wild to be like, here's a guy in a band that I clearly like. And, you know, we're having this funny interaction because we're like mirroring each other outfits wise. But, you know, sometimes like the the it's it's a gut feeling of like, I think I can at least ask like the worst thing that he's going to say is no. And then we. Move right. On. Exactly. You know, hopefully we don't match at a, at a show or any other <laughs> public outing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's really cool to see that like that happened and then that turned into like what the band is today. So it's uh it's very it's very cool to see that. And, and again, the other aspect and what's similar to me is like 
I think there's a lot of people in our age demographic, maybe even a little bit younger, that feels like, oh, if I don't play in a band that gets internationally recognized or known by the time I hit like 23 or 24, it's like I've I've wasted it, I misplayed it, um, whatever. And you know, some people like don't start in in bands into their you know into their 30s and beyond. And for me, it was a similar thing where, um, you know, obviously starting Scope that kept me very busy, but at at a certain point, I was like, I need to be on the other side and I need to be back because I was playing in many a bands before then. And it was more like, you know, there would be projects that would just be for myself and or projects that would just be like, I'm just showing up to play and I'm not really contributing on the songwriting or anything. But as soon as it was like, oh, I'm playing in a band now that's like being able to go out to act like, you know, and being able to go and play fast and, and do a little bit of touring like but I'm closer to 30 than I am 20. Like, right. to me, I don't know. Like, there, there's obviously undeniable obstacles as you get older that you have to, like, juggle and, and find a way around. Like, bands that are young and in their early 20s who can just live at home and just, like, fuck off and do whatever. Like, that is definitely the time to do that if you are granted those opportunities. But I do right. see, especially with social media and the internet and just people being able to discover music at large now it's very cool to see bands that who are a little bit older finally get that like oh like we could do something that we've all like we've all dreamed of being able to go to europe and do all these things so um i think it's cool to finally see you know it's it's not like oh it's finally happening but it's just cool that it actually did happen yeah, it's it's funny because like I actually remember um, and I won't name any names because it's like not worth it. But when I was in high school, there was this band like this like local metal band in Oklahoma that um, they had like unsavory, um, very heavily Christian messaging um, that was like pretty gross. And um, they were like pretty visceral on stage, uh, like like the type of Christian messaging that you're like, Ooh, like Jesus, where, what kind of show am I at right now? <laughs> Jesus and, uh, intended. <laughs> yeah, it was straight up. Yeah. And, uh, they were all older. They were all like thirties and probably early forties at that time. And I remember being a teenager and being like, hang it up, man. Like you're embarrassing yourself. Like this is obnoxious and you don't even know how obnoxious it is. Like, like let us have our scene and go away. Like, and I was playing like metalcore at the time. So for me, it was like, you know, like I wanted, I just wanted heavy bands and I just wanted like to be at a cool show. I didn't want to get this like old man on stage, like preaching his bizarre, like conservative Christian views at the crowd. It was this mm. like very Oklahoma moment. And I was just like, these old dudes have got to go. And I had this, you know, that mindset. And it's funny because I kind of vowed, like, even though Life Force was never supposed to be, like, anything other than just, like, a studio project for fun, uh, at when we start, I was, like, I was, like, 27, you know, and so I was, like, <clears throat> I won't be the cringe old guy, and I'm probably <laughs> missing the mark, I'm sure that I am, like, I'm sure that I'm striving to like, be, I'm striving yeah, to be, yeah, like, I'm, <laughs> like, I cannot become the cringe old dude that won't shut up or whatever, and I know that there are kids at shows, you know, like like Zoomers coming to shows in their late teens that are like, get this fucking old guy <laughs> off the stage. Like, you know, I know it's happening and it's like fine because it's like now I'm like, yeah, all right, fair enough. Like I can't, I really can't shit on those teenagers because like hardcore is a youth culture. It's like all my favorite music from the scene is was written by like, 16 year old kids squatting in like dilapidated buildings in New York city. You know what I mean? So right. it's like, it has to stay a youth culture. And it's like, if you try as someone in our age group, if you try and like, kind of like rest that away from the scene and be like, no, no, it, you know, it's being driven by the older folks. Now it's like, you're please don't like, mm -hmm. let it be a youth culture and just participate in that, which is fine. Like, and do things like scoped or do things like, you know, I'm the only person in the room with a microphone and you have to listen to what I'm saying, uh, you know, do that things in ways that will contribute and add to that. But like, you know, let it be, let it be an organic youth culture. Cause it should be in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very, I think everyone listening to this probably had some old head in their scene who was just like, 
anytime <laughs> they walked in the room, it was like the They're like oh <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. But it, it like yeah. for me, it there's a lot of things in my life where I was always looking up to like certain individuals. And that could be anyone like within my personal circles that I'm like, you know, everyone's five years plus. Hardcore specifically was very much like that. And now it's like it's kind of like you blink and I'm like, oh shit, I'm that person now that I'm are. yeah, right, dude. Yeah. Yes. I cannot like lean into that point. And it's so that's been the weirdest transition for me because like I had personal heroes or have personal heroes or whatever uh, in hardcore that like now, like I can text them and Mm -hmm. be like, yo, well, you know, I'm in Europe and I just thought about, we're listening to your record and I, you know, I'm driving down the road and I just thought that was cool. I wanted to say hi or whatever. And like the fact that that's that is even a thing, or that like Scott from Earth Crisis is like on, you know, has remastered our record or whatever. Like those types of things, I now do kind of take for granted in a way that, like, if I kind of take a step back, I'm like, dude, that's fucking crazy. Like right. that's the way that that has happened, and is like I need to stay grateful for that shit because it's bizarre. Like it's it's so cool, but it's like you know, and talking to Evan. So Evan, um, shout out Evan from Broken Vow and Ankle Biter. Um, he filled in for Life Force in Europe. And um, we know each other because he, I used to do, I don't think he still does it, um, but he used to do a zine when he lived in Orange County when he was like in high school. Mm-hmm. And um, he reached out and was like, you know, for our first issue, I want to, I want it to be an interview with you. And, you know, I love your records and blah, blah, blah. And so for me, like having like a teenage dude reach out, like that was really flattering. I was like, that's cool. You know, like that feels validating for my old ass, you know, and (laughs) like putting out a zine, like that's so like old school and it feels like authentic, you know, and, and he, he actually brought it up when we were, we're sitting in the van, like we had a driver. So like none of us had to really pay attention when we were driving. Like we were just kind of like fucking off and like van moshing and whatever. <laughs> and um, he like- The only thing you should be doing if you have a driver while you're on. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> van exactly, moshing. yeah, Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It became, it became like a thing where we had to kind of like constantly be aware of like what was playing. And it's like, oh, the King Nine intro is coming on. So we have to like kind of like look around and be like, it's like, yes, straight <laughs> who's up. in danger at this moment? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like that was anyway. So we're doing that and we're like eating food or whatever. We're like sitting in the van. And he was like, it's kind of crazy that like you and me were talking on the phone like three years ago for a zine interview. And like now I'm playing in that band like with you uh-huh. in Europe, like how cool. And it was just kind of this like really whole, again, like, like kind of like you were, you were talking about earlier with Cayman. It's just like this real like human moment. And it was like, okay, cool. Like I might be like the cringe old guy who like only likes old bands or whatever. And I, I, I can accept that, but at least I got like this cool, you know, younger dude who's in cool younger bands who is at least willing to be like, Hey, that's like, like, I want to acknowledge that this is really cool and this is happening. So it's like, I'll take what I can get. Like I can't complain. Yeah, I think being like hyper aware of how like how um how gratitude really goes a long way and be and for me it's like some people could view that as like oh just like saying all this stuff is like again so cornball. So I know it's not for everyone, but to me it's very important to be able to say on this podcast or like even just sending a text to that person. Um I think I I said at the beginning it's like I'm working on some um, special announcements and projects for scoped and something that uh, is tied to that is I'm going through a lot of really old footage like some of the very first shows that I had ever filmed even before scoped even started because I filmed prior to a year before like putting it under a name because oh, over yeah. over time I was like trying to get some freelance video gigs and everyone's like why can you shoot a, a, a commercial for our donut company when uh you're just filming people beat the shit out of each other so i had to kind of like <laughs> maybe it's it's time to to split it but um you know the where i grew up in winnipeg like the hometown hero band for me was comeback kid so i would see right. you know them come through multiple multiple times even before i was even filming shows and um you know i was going through i think the first time i filmed them was in um or one of the first times was in uh edmonton which is just like three hours north of where i live now and you know i was like you know i went with my wife and i like was filming wake the dead and i was like hey like it's dog shit video i don't recommend people to go to try to find it but i like handed it off to her we were just dating at the time and then like 
went to go stage dive. Like, film me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool. But it's just like, I just want to get one in. There's all these like funny things with uh with andrew specifically where it's like i've stage dived during wake the dead because it's it's as a winnipegger i feel like i have to do it but there was one specific show that they were playing where there was like a shot where i was like kind of on top of the crowd i had my hands up or something and then we've become friends and and he's been on the podcast and we like chat like pretty regularly and then the last time that I got to see them. I got to play with them. And it was the same thing. Like, Wake, it, Wake the Dead comes in. I hand off the camera. I have to do that. So it, so we've been able to replicate that photo, like, multiple years in a row. So That is um, so cool. Like, yeah. what an awesome feeling for you, too. Totally. Like, yeah. And it's like, kid, I, you know? I say that because it's like, I, you know, I'm thinking, like, Valentine's Day is coming up. So it's like, I think... I encourage people to give roses when the opportunity presents itself. And, you know, like, like we were saying a little earlier, like when you go to shows and some, you're coming up to someone, you're saying like, yo, your music means a lot to me. Like sometimes like there's a fear of like, I know you get this all the time, or I know like right. you're tired cause you just got off stage. Like there's a bit of self-awareness as far as when you're going to be able to do that. Um, but I, I love that shit because to me, those are the, those are the um those are the tales and the memories that like make me think about being in this shit for 40 years not just you know four months yeah it's funny man because like that like you hear uh you know the cliche in like rom-coms or whatever like when people talk about like you know there'll be a funeral scene or there'll be some sad moment and they're like you know don't miss the little things that's the good parts whatever blah, blah 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 and it's like corny and cliche but it's like that's a cliche for a reason like that those little moments of like like i'm in fucking dusseldorf and a dude i'm like completely drenched it's the biggest show of the european tour and a dude comes up to me like wearing a straight edge varsity coat and he's like my friend in like extremely broken english she's like your record means so much and i would like to take a photo with you can you put your coat on so we can match and he like has blonde hair and he's like we look a lot alike because my family's german or whatever Mm. so it's like this like cousin of mine or something coming up and like it would be easy because i'm like fucking dead and like drenched should be like dude can you give me like a few seconds please like die i'm fucking dying right now Mm -hmm. but like that's the good shit man like that little moment like that's the shit that i'm like that's so cool like that that guy came up and so I have like this photo with, you know, this, my doppelganger somewhere in Germany, like, <laughs> you know, it's just like, that's, that shit is what, like, that's what makes it worth it to me. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, so you brought up the, the, the coat, the, and, and multiple yeah. people have the straight edge varsity jacket. Um, yeah, yeah. and I, I'm, pr- I'm 90 90- three percent sure that you saw a a few months ago there was a bit of like someone was making fun of someone who was wearing one of those at a show did you see oh yeah 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 yeah. i saw it so i actually i got a bunch of sales because of that situation really yeah 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 (laughs) i don't know if you know i yeah so i have like this side hustle where i make those coats okay and um so it's this like i'll plug it it's it's called glory bound varsity Mm -hmm. and um it's on instagram and it's just it's Basically, it was because I, uh, my senior gift from my parents, they were like, you know, like, what do you want? Do you want to go out to a big dinner? Or what do you blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I want a straight edge varsity jacket. Or whatever. Mm. And they were like, yeah, for sure. And then we like looked up the pricing and it was like, fucked how expensive it was <laughs> to get like a, like a custom varsity coat. It's really expensive. And at mm-hmm. this time, like I wasn't vegan. So it was this like all leather, all wool, like really expensive like nice Jostens coat or whatever. Sure. And they were basically, my parents were like, no, like that's <laughs> really expensive. And like, we're not doing that. Yeah, no And way. so I had to like, I had to kind of like get crafty with how to look up how to do it. And um, I found this like little local shop that doesn't exist anymore um, in Oklahoma city. And um, they put one together for me. And literally ever since then, and I still have that one, I just don't wear it ever. But um, people would come up and be like, where'd you get this? And I'd be mm. like, I, like had it made or whatever and it happened enough to where i started making them just for my friends gotcha. and then that became a side business and i've made a ton of them now i think i've i think i've made like 160 of them or something so wow okay like a ton of them and so um when that kid was getting roasted by some asshole at a show that was like 
I don't wear a jacket that says I'm vegetarian or whatever the fuck she said. And uh, she like put it on Twitter. A bunch of people tagged me and they were like, is this your boy? Like she's shitting on your jacket or whatever. And, it, I, and it's funny because like I didn't make his coat, right. but so many people tagged me in that thread like mm -hmm. over and over and over again because I guess they they were like, that's your shit. And they're, you know, right. whatever. So well, I'm very familiar with the situation. So very funny connecting of worlds. So that person who got the picture taken of is a friend of mine out in oh, Vancouver. Nice. Uh, okay. His name is Byron. He plays in a band called the Morning Star. Um, they're going. They're playing uh, LDB Fest. Um, he he and I go way back. He was like one of the very first people that I really interacted with when I first moved to Alberta. Um, and it was just wild that like I'm like you know it is luckily if anything is going to happen, I guess, online in that way. At least it's not just him, like, front and center. It's just, like, sure. I guess the back of him. But it was just yeah. wild to be, like, like, and it's funny because I've reached out to him to be on the podcast as well. Not to talk about that specifically, but just, like, with other <laughs> things. But I was like, man, I can't even imagine just, like, I'm just, <clears throat> I'm just existing and, like, wearing something that I believe in. But it, it create, it, it got my mind on a bit of a tangent as far as, like, I know, and I've done my research as far as why that jacket and that style of like apparel was very formative in the early years of hardcore. Um, but I'm not sure if people within the, you know, the social media, the TikTok, like hardcore kind of crossover are like privy to that because you definitely don't don't see that at every single show. I, you would definitely sure. see it at 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 least one at at a fest anywhere in uh in the yeah. states but like right. i don't know if there's any thoughts that you have on that where like obviously like you're very pro because you have like a side <laughs> hustle and all that but like right. has that been have you seen the um the uh the oh what is that like go away like as you know because it is tied to a style and a, a you know yeah. a way that people are doing it but again it it, it goes more than just a piece of fabric and it's funny, man. It it has come in waves. So I was like, I was like 18 when I got my first one. And Fletcher, um, that was one of the things that he was like, yo, that jacket's fucking sick. Like we had just become friends. And he's like, ah, I gotta get one of those. And I'm actually making him one right now, like a life force one, um, which is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. And it'll be his first one or whatever. But like at that is time, that the I only was like, extra one in addition to yours. Um, mine is the only life force one now. Um, okay. but yeah, basically the blue one. And he was like, um, you know, the, the fact that you made it like a band one instead of like a geographic location or whatever, mm. he was like, I think I need one. Like, I think I'm going to pull the trigger on it. And I was yeah. like, okay, cool. So, uh, I'm going to, I'm just making it for him out of like stuff that I already had or whatever. And, um, but yeah, so like I was like 18 and I had that coat and it was, you know, like the only people when I was in high school that wore those coats were like the football player dudes at school. Right. And um, I had lettered in multiple things in school um, and none of them were that cool. I mean, like I lettered in tennis and I lettered in band and um, choir. And so I was like a I was like a multiple letter athlete or whatever. Um, I lettered two years in tennis and shit. And so I had those letters, but I was like, I'm not wearing one of those jackets. They're corny. And then I got into hardcore and I saw, I think the first time I ever saw a picture was one was probably, um, it was probably one of the hands tied guys in one. Okay. And I, it was probably on the B nine or something. And I remember being like, Whoa, that's fucking cool. And mm -hmm. then you start noticing like, Oh shit, that's like a thing that people do. And, um, yeah. So then I, I, it was like, Oh nine. And I went to Boston for, um, have hearts last show. And they were fucking everywhere, as you can imagine, at that show. Totally. There was, like, yeah. this gigantic Canadian dude, you'll appreciate this, in, like, a Montreal one. And oh, okay. he was, like, this big, you know, northern giant just beating <laughs> ass at the show in his Letterman jacket. And I remember being, like, okay, like, yeah, this is cool. I'm actually, like, I have this cool thing that I didn't realize was even cooler than I thought or whatever. Right. So, um, yeah, I... I have experienced it go like kind of in waves because then like as recently as I think it was like 2020, um, there was a photo, we played a fest in, um, I think it was St. Louis 
and I wore one of mine on stage. Um, and they don't last long on stage. I always, it's like two songs in and I'm like, fuck this. Why do I do yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but there just happened to be a photo taken, um, like while I'm wearing it. And I was commenting on some, something and, uh, like a younger dude was like, um, I'm not going to take anything that you say seriously because you're obviously like a jock asshole who still thinks Letterman jackets are cool. And he like shit on me. And I, and I remember being like, I, it's so cool that this kid thinks I'm a jock. Like I was like, <laughs> psyched. I, like I, was, I was like, I took it. I was like, I was like, you're like, awesome. I'm actually like, the biggest fucking nerd ever. So that's yeah, a huge right. compliment. Like, Thanks. Bro. I was like, cool. Like I still got it, man. Like I'm in decent shape enough to people think I'm a jock. Like that's fucking, that makes me feel great. <laughs> Um, but it was this like, and then everybody, you know, like the, he got a bunch of likes and everybody was like, yeah, you know, so it's, it's like funny because I, it definitely has come in waves just like every other goofy fashion trend in hardcore. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, totally. I do, I do feel like there have been moments where it's been like, I, like I wore it to a show when I was a kid and there was this big skinhead crew probably still is in Oklahoma. I'm um, like sharp skins. And, um, uh one of the like one of the girlfriends of one of the dudes in that crew like took my picture from behind wearing it and it's it the original one i had said oklahoma so it said like oklahoma straight edge mm. and um i think she she posted it it would have been god i don't think it was myspace days i think it was probably early facebook but it was a while sure. back and um she said like yeah i've heard of people being straight edge but i've never heard of someone lettering in straight edge or something like trying to be funny and um, a bunch of older dudes then, so like early 2000s, and they were already old heads, were like, obviously, you haven't been around in hardcore very long, blah, 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 like jumped to my defense. And right. it's so it's funny, because like, I was already kind of getting shit on, and then people came and defended it for that or whatever. So it's like, I don't know, man, it comes in waves. I think, I think it's cool again. Um, I mean, I see like, the little drawings of people drawing like the little hooded mosher guys. And uh some of them will have the jackets on. So I'm right. kind of like, cool. Like, I mean, I'm, it's like, I'm riding, I'm riding the wave at the top of the get again at the top right. of the crest. So it's, I'm sure it will fall out of fashion again and I'll still wear it. I don't give a shit. So have you done a jacket? I, I, I would be, you know, 160 or 70. I can't remember exactly what number you said, but like, have you done a jacket for every single state or is there certain ones that have not been able to check off the bucket list yet? <sighs> I've done a lot of, as you can imagine, um, and we experienced this firsthand, um, hokey, um, really on the nose youth crew fashion and youth crew music and that aesthetic in general is still like really cool in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, so we experienced that on this run, like where dudes were showing up to the shows, like with their jackets on and shit. And so I saw multiple, like at, it wasn't every show in Europe, but I think like eight of the shows, my customers showed up in their coats. And so it was mm. like kind of cool, you know? Um, and so I've made a lot for people in Europe and um, shipped them over there. Um, I've made a lot in the States, but there a lot of folks tend to do cities um, or they'll do like neighborhoods. Um, so I'm like, not sure. I'm like, I don't know what this is. Like, I don't, I'm not familiar <laughs> with, you know, like, this is Everyone's my street little... name <laughs> it's like yeah right yeah. very so, specific yeah i don't think i've gotten every state i've gotten a lot like definitely both coasts i've made more for people on the coast than anywhere else um right. so that's for sure um i've had some weird ones um like i had a crew of um gamers that are like a pro gamer crew that compete at like I don't know what game it is. I think it was League of Legends. Sure. Okay. Um, they're all straight edge dudes and um, they wanted matching jackets. Um, and I guess it's a phrase. For all I know, these dudes lied to me and this is like some gross <laughs> this is term a, that I'm- We got it. Like, <laughs> yeah, like uh, this might be a gotcha podcast. I don't know. But yeah, uh, I, I don't know. But they ordered uh, four matching coats in matching colors with an X on the front and then on the back, um, I guess it's a phrase in that community of like, if you do a bunch of damage and you're known for doing a bunch of damage when you play these matches, um, and I'm obviously the way I talk, I, I don't know shit about, it. I'm not a gamer at all. So I don't know. I don't, I, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but my assumptions were, um, so the phrase for that, um, when you do a lot of damage is you like, you're pumping damage, like you're like, oh, so-and-so is mm -hmm. pumping damage. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that um, before. 
Okay, good. Thank God. Um, because the, the backs of their jackets on the team, it, it said pumpers only. Oh, okay. And they like, it was like, yeah, we all do lots of damage. I don't know. They, for all I know, that might be some gross, like, yeah, like, is this a sexual thing? And yeah, (laughs) like, I have no clue. But yeah, that was a weird one. Um, I had a dude order one that he was like, um, I used to be an alcoholic and I used to, uh, you know, be a self identified addict and um, I've kicked it now and um, I maintain like almost 100% sobriety, um, but I use, like medicinal marijuana um, as like an anxiety medication and blah, blah, blah. And so I jokingly call myself Weed Edge. Um, can I get a jacket that says Weed Edge? And I, I kind of like drew the line. I was like, I won't do one with an X on the front that says mm-hmm. Weed Edge, but I'll put like your initials on the front or your city's initials and you can have the back say Weed Edge if you would like. And that mm-hmm. would be, I'm cool with that. And so I made one of those and uh, we're talking about like the trends or whatever, a bunch of like old head hardline people showed up out of the woodwork on that post and were not happy. They were pissed that this jacket said weed edge. And they were like, this is a sacred oath type bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, Jesus Christ, guys, like, it's not that deep. It was a joke. And like, this is a dude who I've known, you know, for years and I'm proud of him and I know his sobriety journey and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've made some weird ones um, that aren't geographic, and I've made some like that are like very explicitly just geographic areas. But now I don't think I've quite marked off every state, so that'll I'll have to keep keep trucking along and hope that I can cross them all off one of these yeah. days. Yeah, and and you know like uh, I'm just looking at the Glory Bound uh, Instagram, and we'll link it in the bio in the description. Of, hey, of the pod. yeah, cool. But um, yeah, it's not like this is a straight edge varsity jacket company. It could be like, you know, for for whatever. Um, but, you know, yeah, it just says custom. Yeah. Custom varsity jackets, like all vegan. You know, it's like that's I found really the, the only pump, I found the pumpers only post. That's yeah. so sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually, um, one of those dudes plays in that band, um, Three Week Old Roses. So shout oh, out. Three OK. Week Old Roses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah. band. that's sick. Yeah, yeah, they're fucking awesome, actually. If you like melodic, I mean, you like comeback kids. So if you like melodic hardcore, that band rules. So yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's interesting because obviously, like, that isn't something that you're trying to like, you know, just try to scale up and become this huge thing. It's very like to order. It's a passion thing. Um, but I do think it is very interesting on how, you know, there's certain like. I've been in this shit long enough to see the the trends of like different merch items or like, oh, there's no way that we're going to print on this or like whatever. <laughs> right, yeah. Or like, oh, like this band is a Jordan fours band or whatever it is. Right. But like the <laughs> the varsity jacket side of things, like I don't think like there's obviously specific subgenres that are like way more. They embrace that a lot more. But um, yeah, I, I just think that like, knowing the lore of like how um all these kids who are getting like i think the first time that i was seeing that was when i saw the no more music video and it's like just like oh yeah oh these are just like is this a football Dude, team but then it's like i have people... a i have a fucking story about the no more jacket okay so you know ray capo tours doing yoga mm-hmm and um, I met him on uh, on stage in Austin, and I I like introduced myself to him because I was like fanboying out really hard when I was like a kid, and so I've like you know known who he was since I got into hardcore or whatever in Youth of Today, and um, the No More jacket that he wears it's like a blank blue and white sleeve varsity coat, the one that you're referencing, mm-hmm. and um, I messaged him cold from Glory Bound and was like. This is random, but do you still have that coat? Uh, because I, so I started messaging like Floor Punch and uh, Slapshot and all the older bands that had those jackets and mm-hmm. being like, do you still have them? Because if you do, I think it would be like a cool post to like send you holding it up and being like, you know, here's one of the OGs, like, you know, shout out Glory Bound or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of sending out all these cold messages to people. um, And I actually made, I remade the original smorgasbord coat um, for one of the, so, cause that's like the first one that Mm. is like, uh, everyone kind of agrees that the smorgasbord coat was like the first one. 
I actually remade the smorgasbord coat. Um, so that was like really fucking cool. Like this like weird moment of like full circle. Mm -hmm. So I, I, in the process of doing that, I sent a message to Ray and I was like, do you still have your jacket? And he was like, unfortunately I don't, I don't know where it ended up and blah, blah, blah. And then he was like, I need to get one from you. And I was like, well, say the word, dude, I'll fucking make you anything you want and I'll send it to you for free. Like, you know, like, right. And so he was like, well, I'm at, this was pre COVID, but he was like, um, I'm going to be in Houston, um, for a, a yoga retreat in, you know, later in the year. Um, I'd love to grab lunch. And, um, if you have a jacket that, you know, that you'd like me to have, like, I'd take it. And so I took his order of like what he wanted on it. Cause I guess after that video shoot, he put like three little stars on the jacket. So he had these like three stitched stars and that was all it ever said. Hmm. So I like went and found like custom embroidered star patches that I was going to sew onto the front. And then oh, I was wow. going to put youth of today on it and bring it to him. And then COVID fucking happened. Hmm. And, um, he, he got sick and the yoga retreat got canceled and it, it has never happened but i literally still have it because i'm like one one of these days like we're gonna cross paths and i will literally be able to be like i'm good on that promise that's, dude I that's got your something jacket. you need to physically hand over not put in a UPS exactly. package and, and send it off for sure yeah exactly yeah but you, yeah you that need to coat, be, be able to see it through but that's very 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 cool yeah. So that, that video is like iconic and any of the photos of the youth crew, like the, not of like youth crew kids, but the youth crew, yes. like youth of mm -hmm. today and their homies, like you, they all have them on or they are like, multiple of them have them on. And it's, it's, so it's like, yeah, that it's funny that you mentioned that because yeah, it, obviously it's tied to certain very specific, like sub sub genres or whatever, but like, you know, it's, it's just neat to see it like come back around or at least kind of still stick around a little bit. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely something that I that I hope doesn't just get lost in the um, in the new wave of like, you know, more kids and, and social like I think it's something that that obviously needs to be uh, remembered and uplifted at the same time. Um, so you, you I want to kind of shift back to uh, the life force stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. The uh, the very first song on on the latest record, which is also your Instagram um handle is higher standards and yeah. uh you know when i was reading uh you did a, a no echo interview in 2021 where you were talking about that song specifically about how that is like kind of a a dedication or kind of like a like the song is specifically about like how hardcore needs to have higher standards when it comes to what we're singing about um what we're talking about in between the songs um and we've talked about this a little bit uh, on the interview already um and i can hear some of the um what's the word i want to use i like some of the um grievances when it comes to like uh. you know bands that are you know maybe hype right now but they don't really have any any actual things to say so like yeah why does like and i love the the whole ideology like i've read through the lyrics a couple times today and i was like yeah like it i like how you say all style no substance because you are you are identifying that yeah you you know songs are sick band has swag you know whatever whatever you want to spin it but like at the end of the day if it doesn't have like something to be able to take away from like not like what's the point but it's like can can we have a higher standard to that so anything you want to clarify add to that um when it comes to you know you're the one that wrote the fucking song so <laughs> well so um i appreciate you like uh identifying with it because that's fucking cool and i appreciate the the sentiment there um i have to give credit where credit is due because i actually um uh, so there's a, a song that, um, I heard when I was younger, um, by verbal assault and it is kind of about the same, same exact thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, it like had a pretty profound effect on me. Um, mostly because like Oklahoma hardcore is like not renowned for, you know, like being like a cool hyped hotspot, or at least it wasn't. And maybe one day it will be. And mm -hmm. people like our friend, our common friend, Aaron, and act like, you know, are like, doing badass things and putting it on the map which is fucking incredible like mm -hmm. can't ascribe a, a value to that obviously um but for me as a kid hearing that song um and being kind of like oh shit like it doesn't really matter like it's not that's not really what's important it's not like 
how cool you are or like how fresh your clothes are or like whatever. It's like the substance that is important. And that, that like, it like stuck with me like big time. And then, uh, to have, uh, like a record. So I got really lucky with my age where, um, the things we carry dropped, like I was the target demo, you know, like I bought it on a pre-order and I, was really plugged in to what B9 was doing when Have Heart put that record out. Mm -hmm. And um, Pat has a lyric on that record that I pretty shamelessly pulled from. Um, and it's, uh, you know, partially homage, partially I wrote the lyrics not really realizing where I was pulling from. You know, that and if you have ever written lyrics, you know, like sometimes you'll write something, you'll be like, whoa, I'm this profound thinker. And then you like, you're like, you just ripped off one of your favorite bands, like, and mm. you weren't aware of it or whatever. Happens with riffs too. I know you're a guitarist. Oh. So it's, it's, you'll play a riff and you'll be like, I just wrote the greatest song of all time. And you're like, oh, it's a Slayer track. Got it. For yeah. Sure. I'd be like, um, yo, this riff is sick. And I'm like, oh, this is one <laughs> note off from being the Halo 2 intro. Uh, <laughs> can I get away with that? Yeah, sure. Let's yes. Just, let's absolutely. That's the coolest shit I've ever heard. Yeah. yeah. I remember you telling me that story. So yeah. <laughs> um, but no, so, um, yeah, I, I kind of like uh, accidentally, but then once I realized it, I like just leaned into it because I was like, well, it's still true. I look up to Pat more than any individual lyricist of all time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was in that sweet spot where he was exploding before he was, now he's this kind of like enigma, like the most famous dude in hardcore history probably ever. And he will probably stay that way forever, regardless of what Fiddlehead does or whatever. Um, but it was kind of before that he was like a kid, like he was like young and have heart was, they hadn't done a full world tour or anything, you know, like they were still just a Boston straight edge band. Mm. And, um, so reading that and having like reinforced, um, at, as a teenager, it was like, okay, cool. Like this guy who I look up to, who like I, in my opinion is like the best lyricist in hardcore and like, who is very smart and has, you know, like good opinions on things he's saying the same thing of that song that i read when i was younger and like cool that's definitely the right take like that's you know you don't you don't want to let something that should be like a subculture of substance um and then it's funny because that even is a lyric that he wrote after have heart he did a band called wolf whistle and he wrote this song that was it was kind of like the, an angrier take on the same message which was like don't let this subculture of substance like drown in the mainstream like it has to stay you know substantial it has to have a message that is worthwhile um because otherwise it's just fucking rock and roll mm -hmm. and so that vibe has like, has like it's been like a consistent through line since i've been like a hardcore fanboy not just a lyricist and so then with this project, it was one of those things that like I'd written about it before in past projects, but past projects had never really had much of an impact, much of a platform. And so for this record, I was like, I want this to be like the opening track because I want this to set the tone. Like if no one's ever heard of the band before and they only listen to one song, even if they don't like it, I want it to be this one song that mm -hmm. people absorb. And it, it was in response to my own experiences, but it was also, um, you know, whether you view it as a good or a bad thing, um, there does seem to be a tendency, at least maybe partial outsider looking in vibe, because I'm still not in a place that's like, you know, I'm not in one of the bigger scenes in the US. I'm not going to shows every two nights, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not plugged in to, um, you know, what's on the cutting edge of cool in hardcore. And I'm kind of cool with that <laughs> personally, but, um, <laughs> Maybe I'm completely off base, but I, I'm going to stick by my guns on it and say that, like, if what's cool is based specifically only on, you know, how hard your mosh is um, and how, you know, if you're bragging about being ignorant, like, oh, this this band's ignorant as fuck. Like, this is, this is, you know, I see all these jokes online about, like, heavy bands or people being like, you know, that's that's illiteracy mosh or whatever. And I'm like cool you know like that's not cool to me like i mm. i think that it message needs to stay forefront and it needs to be the right messaging like it's like it needs to be a subculture of substance like if we let it devolve into just this dumbed down collection of 
who has the coolest merch, who moshes the hardest, who writes the most ignorant riffs. And there is no component to those because those things are all fine on their own, but they can't be the focal point. And if there is no component of a substantial message, then it's, in my opinion, it's like, then the soul's gone. The soul that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, it's like, that's what keeps hardcore as its own special little bright spot that people crowd around. And if that soul is lost, then like, that's a huge tragedy to me. So that's, that's definitely like kind of what pushed me to write that or whatever. And um, I'm one of the, maybe some people would say punishing. I'm sure some people do. Um, but I'm one of those vocalists that like, I, I talk as much on stage as we play on stage pretty much. And um, that was something that, you know, bands like, like I have now we were talking about like these heroes that you looked up to. And then my, now your friends up with my friend, Greg, he sang for a band trial and Greg has always been unabashedly, unembarrassingly loud mouth on stage. And he has a message that he gets across and he's a great example, but there are tons of them that, that were that way and have been and are currently that way. And I always said, like, if I'm ever the vocalist and I ever have that soapbox and I'm the one with the microphone that people have to listen to, I'm going to make use of it. And so, you know, maybe I maybe I take it to a degree that people find annoying. I don't really give a shit, um, but it's, you know, I, I feel like it needs to be something that people um, put time into and put thought into and they have intelligent messaging and they have you know, worthwhile things to say on stage, because otherwise it's, it's feels very soulless, feels very like masturbatory or whatever you want to say that to where it's like, you know, you can just go play rock gigs if you want to be a rock star. Like that's mm. not what this is supposed to be about. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like majority of the bands when I was first discovering this stuff, um, like they, like the, the bands and the vocalists that would say something in between songs that would just like really like hit me hard and it would be anything on like a personal note of like this song is about losing someone or 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 something to that nature versus something that's you know like maybe it's like leaning way more political and it's like actually educating right. people about something versus just like this is my you know my life story or my my struggle and this is what i wrote about it um but even uh when i kind of transitioned into starting to film shows um, a, a big reason of doing the way that I do is like, um, obviously like we've all watched like a Hey Five Six set. And when, he, when Sonny was on, I, I talked to him about, I would hate, I would hate watching a set of a band and the song ends and then it just like fade cuts into the next song. And I'm like, yeah. well, what did that, what did X band member say in between those songs? And for Sonny, like he totally agrees, but there's also like the extra layer where it was just actually more work to be able to like cut the song and then cut it out. So he's like, just film it, you know, plop it in, throw some presets and a title and, and send it off. Um, but I think that's really, really important because like, you know, you're looking at and if you look at any other genre, like there's not really any others that um that a create the space for that and b almost right. like require you know for something to be said well there aren't other genres explicitly but there are other bands in other genres that are made up of either x or current hardcore kids sure that yeah that's a great point paramore mm -hmm. um like my wife and i went and saw paramore um on their most recent tour and Haley, to her credit immediately like after the first song like she talks some shit on stage and it's awesome. Like it, I mean, it's like being at a hardcore show and she right. obviously comes from that world. And mm -hmm. so like you, you can feel that. Um, and it's funny because like, like Pat, I mean, Fiddlehead. Yeah. It's like, you could, whether you call it hardcore or whether you don't, doesn't really matter. But uh, you know, watching even Fiddlehead play shows where obviously some of the crowd, whether they're coming more from the like, uh, soft kill vibe like shoegazy adjacent to hardcore crowd um that have no clue what hardcore is and don't give a fuck and have no intention to or whatever mm -hmm. but like to pat's credit he has never stopped like every band he's done like it's before fiddlehead it was wolf whistle and sweet jesus and before that it was have heart like he has always been consistent in that and he has not just smart shit to say but like 
shit that no one else is saying. Like no one else is bringing those subjects up. And it's like, even like to your point, even when it's something as personal as like personal loss, he still has, you know, shit to say, like arguments with my father or my grandfather or whatever. Like he brings it up in a way that it's like, oh, cool. I also have felt those things. And like, I am now more connected to this scene in a way that it has emotional value for, you know, the individuals in the crowd. Like that's, that's gotta be what it's about. In my opinion, like if you lose that, it's I'm good. I'm out. Cause it, yeah. because that's that, what that has to be the focal point. Yeah. And I, and you know, I want to, this is a very tumultuous uh, topic to tackle, but I think that there is like, there's definitely times where someone is so um, pissed and uh, frustrated about a specific thing that like, you know, like a lot of the, the a lot of the times, like, I almost think that, like, some of the stuff that you want to say shouldn't be like this, like, let me rehearse this at jam practice and whatever. Like, right. sometimes the um, off the cuff and, like, that stuff that isn't just, like, tra- just being as transparent as possible actually hits the hardest than something that's like, all right, let me pull up my fucking notes app off the, you know, right, yeah, thing in the world that I want to talk about, um, you know, but and some sometimes, like, people just need to be like, you know, I was at I played a show just a few days ago and one of the opening bands uh, said something like, you know, what's the best way to deal with a rapist? Shoot them in the fucking head. And sometimes someone's in that position to be like, I'm just so frustrated off of a specific thing that I just need to say it this way, not to be hard or whatever. But it's just like that. That is just the um, and, and I, that's I, enough. Yeah, yes. it doesn't have to be a grandstand speech necessarily. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and I'm I'm and again I'm kind of curious on you know I'm not trying to play devil's advocate specifically but uh, I've talked about this on the podcast before where if every single band you know like you know woke it was it was almost like if it was like a late '90s early 2000s movie kind of like Freaky Friday like there was an earthquake and then every single vocalist was just had the the most beautifully eloquented speech for whatever specific <laughs> thing that they wrote about. I I think if it was every single band doing that, it would it almost would lose lose a little bit of its luster. Um, I know it's funny because we've had this ar- I've had this argument, exact argument, mm-hmm. um, with band members who are like, "Can you fucking tone it down a little bit? Like, can you <laughs> trim it back?" And it's funny because like, yeah, I I I definitely agree. I mean, I think that personally, if I was at a show where every vocalist was like, "This next song's about mental health." here are the ways that's affected me. Here are what you can do to, you know, fight your own battles, blah, blah, blah. This next song is about straight edge or whatever. Right. And they all had things where they were like, here's what I got to say. Here's why it's important. Blah, 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 blah. I would personally be like hyped as fuck. Like I would be, I would be in heaven <laughs> if that happened, but I know that like, I'm the outlay. I am the outlier. In sure, that. And sure. The, like, I also like, I, with everything that I've said, I can contradict myself too, because I get that there are bands that like, they are fun. They're supposed to be fun. They don't need to be serious. And like, that's obviously not who that song is about. Like, this is like, when you go to a tsunami show, like you're going to a tsunami show for a reason. Like that's, I understand that vibe. Right. And that's like, not really what I'm addressing. What I'm addressing is like the glorification of, and the like, um, pedestal rising of like glorified stupidity in a way that it's like, anti-intellectualism moves to the front and you start uh, almost avoiding intelligent conversations intentionally, that's really what the message rails against in that song. And it's, and I, I will stand by that, like as long as I am alive, because like that, I feel like anti-intellectualism and letting something backslide into being just a music genre where people beat the fuck out of each other for, and if there's no other component to it other than that, like, that is not a healthy thing that should no longer exist in my mm-hmm. opinion. Yeah. I think um, it, it it's very interesting that we're bringing this up because even the bands that are like, you know, self-aware on how like dumb, dumb down a lot of things are. If there is something that is pressing on the heart of the, the person who is holding the microphone or maybe even, even they will someone still else, say some shit, they yeah. will still be like, I need to say something. And I think yeah. the, the the idea of like, you know, not 
taking the the space that you occupy whether it's on stage or in the scene as at large like being able to be like you know i need to say something about this scene about like how dope it is or like you know like you know whatever the circumstances or there's something within the world that's happening that we're all witnessing to me that's how like i think we all process things like the minute that like um you know this is I want to make sure that we don't get too off the rails on on this topic. But as an example, when the first few shows started to happen still in the midst of COVID, um, a lot of people were like, it's about time. And a lot of people were like, it's way too early. And I, I went to ax to grind because they did a whole episode where they were talking about like, you know, like let's, let's lay it out and let's have that conversation. Let's do that. And I think that's kind of the thing um, when it comes to it. So I, you know, it's it's funny that I think there needs to be that diversity of like um having bands that, you know, like Life Force that will like, you know, actually like talk about these things in depth because, you know, like maybe that's not the norm right now. Um, but you know, I think there also needs to be bands to be able to like have a a little bit of um things things to to showcase either or. But at the end of the day, when something is that needs to be spoken on. I know that there are vocalists that are playing in those bands that are like, just, Oh, the most ignorant riffs, but they'll still go and say something, you know, you brought up tsunami and like, you know, there are times yeah. where Joseph has said things during sets that I've watched of him either online or in person. It's like, I think it's almost cool to be able to like play in this band. That's do like, both to do yeah. both. Yes. A hundred percent. Well, and it's funny because like, obviously he is like an intelligent dude. Like when you, if you speak with that dude or you hear him talk or whatever, like I'm not shitting on the band or him as individuals, because obviously that band was written as a project to be like a fun thing that they intentionally go for. And then even though that might be the case to his credit, he's got smart shit to say Mm -hmm. and he's, he's grabbing that mic and he's using that platform still. So it's like, you really can't even, there aren't a lot of really good examples of like bands that do not and will never have intelligent shit to say. Cause mm-hmm. luckily hardcore kind of still has that soul. Um, and I think even the, even the most like dumbed down ignorant bands that are like psyched about being dumbed down ignorant bands to your point, like if there's a tragedy or whatever in their area or nationally, that's enough of like a, you know, a collective trauma it does usually get brought up. Um, but the problem is there are people in the scene that are like, you know, you can, you can look up, I mean, it's been a thing since hardcore began, like you can look up inside out videos and like Zach is on stage doing his thing, saying shit into the mic, talking shit when he needs to be talking shit. And there's someone in the back of the room. that's like, just play your music. And he's like, fuck you, shut up or whatever. Like he's like almost like heckling him. And so it's like not new, like those kind of bad actor, bad attitude, uh, you know, I just want to mosh type motherfuckers. They've been around forever. So it's like not a new thing. Um, and luckily, I think most people don't fall into that camp. But for for the people who do, that was specifically who that song was written to. It's like we can't let those people who might be those hecklers or they might be those idiots and they're psyched about the fact that they're idiots. They can't be the loudest people in the room like we have to actively fight against that Mm -hmm. yeah and i i think the last thing that i wanted to add on this topic is like um you know they're like the maybe more dumbed down like bands that might fall into that like metallic beat down category if you want to if you want to broad stroke it that way but there's also like there's other um bands who are maybe in that metalcore even metallic space that are like oh like we don't really say anything in between songs and we have samples and all that but i still know certain people that are like Yo, know, I like we're playing this fest. I need to say, you know, something that's like, you know, like I don't normally talk and like, you know, like there's a lot of front men and women and people that like are naturally very, very shy and you wouldn't expect that. Sure. And they're screaming in your face at the highest decibels possible. Um, but it is cool it- to see that at least there's something ingrained in the through line of hardcore and DIY music that's like, you know, don't take the opportunity don't um take the opportunity and squander yeah yes yeah love that word that's the five dollar word of the episode 
right. Yeah. Don't squander that like soapbox, man. Like how often in our, in like a normal person's life, that's you wake up, you go to work, you know, you eat food, you go to sleep or whatever. Like how often in our lives do we get the opportunity to stand on a stage in front of thousands of people or tens of thousands of people right. and like voice our opinions. Like, I mean that for regular people that doesn't really happen that often. And mm. it's like to have a subculture, especially a radical subculture that falls left of, of the political spectrum that has opinions that may be, you know, counter to what is normal. And hopefully they are, you know, to be able to let, you know, that voice be heard by that, like by a Coachella crowd, like, dude, that's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable opportunity. Like don't waste that shit. Yeah. You know? And like opportunities aside, like just the actual skill set of being able to talk to people and have your like voice be, you know, more than just like a conversational thing. Like that's something that's invaluable to like, you know, your professional life, like other things, like I'm doing something right now is like a little bit of a side hustle where I need to like be on a microphone and like talk to people and uh, mm. seeing like the the boss uh, or the dude that runs this like kind of side business is like, yeah, like, you know, some people they need a few times to be able to do that. I'm like, I'm totally like, I, I've talked to people <laughs> so many times, like, you know, it's more of like the technical side of this program, but like, give me a mic and I can fucking, you know, walk through that easy. And I've witnessed people yeah. that maybe don't have those experience that, that you or I have who are like, at the minute that they can hear their own voice, they're like, oh, fuck. And they're stumbling <laughs> you know, over the words and yeah. It's funny. Um, I'll and I'll let let you get to the next question or whatever because I I am a person who is a un, I'm in a bad way about uh, I tend to not know when I'm talking too much and it is no it is. I'm Maybe that's very much I'm enjoying most. everything that we're hitting on so don't apologize uh, at all. So one of our it, keep that we for the, the Canadians to do. Sorry. To get to yeah. That. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, so we were at uh, one of our shows in Belgium a couple of weeks ago and um, we had this idea in the van. So we kept getting to the end of our set. We had fill-ins, right? And apparently in Europe, it's a very common thing for people. They're like, encore, encore, like keep going. Um, and that kept happening. But we like didn't have more music to play because we our <laughs> fill-ins like only knew nine songs or eight songs. Right. And so it was like, we physically can't play more music. Like we don't have collectively as a group more to offer. And so then we were in the van the next morning after one of the, one of the times where that happened and we were like, damn, should we like have something in reserve to, to just play for fun that is like off kind of off the beaten path for our, our style or whatever. And we were tossing around ideas and um, we were like, what if we did, you know, because of, and I don't know, like you said, you read the lyrics, which I appreciate. Um, but Obviously, um, my take on straight edge and how it needs to be a positive force for people and um, specifically it needs to be a force of positivity for people who may not be straight edge um, doesn't fall in line with the very traditional um, kind of more aggressive take that can be found in songs like Firestorm. Sure. <laughs> and uh, that's not really in line with my messaging necessarily, um, even though I love Earth Crisis and I, and I have had that song dedicated to me by earth crisis, like at, when we played with them before. And I was like, of course, like extremely flattering. And like, I know every word or whatever. Um, but it's a little off from my personal take on, on the situation of, of, uh, what straight edge should be in messaging wise. And, uh, we were like, well, what if we did that? But we, we did it as like, okay, we're, this is not life force playing this song. We're now just going to play a song that's fun that everyone knows um as an encore if we get asked and so we were right. like okay let's let's learn it so we did and um we like you're like this is going to be ridiculous like it because it doesn't make sense with the way that we sound and like, you know <laughs> the things that i'm saying on stage it just doesn't mesh really right but we we're like it's an it, alter whatever. ego kind of encore yeah right yeah so um and i brought that up i was like i don't know how comfortable i am with the messaging of this song necessarily for me personally i don't necessarily agree with it I don't know how badly I want to espouse the things I espouse during our set and then almost immediately contradict myself. Sir. And uh, <laughs> so Evan um, from Broken Val and Ankle Biter goes, what if we swapped? What if you play guitar and I'll do vocals? And I was like, this is a good idea. And so we're in Belgium. 
we play our show. Um, we're pretty much done. And we're like, you know, putting amps on standby and like wiping our fucking faces or whatever. And the crowd is like, keep playing, keep playing or whatever. And we kind of looked at each other. I was like, all right, it's happening. Like, mm -hmm. let's do it. And so uh, I handed the mic to Evan. He handed me his guitar. And uh, so I can say I've, I've, I've played guitar uh, on tour in Europe as a guitarist, which is <laughs> it's insane because I am yeah. not a guitarist. Like I am not, uh, thank God most of the song is like open E. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, he hands me his guitar and he, the first thing he said was, obviously Flint likes to talk. Um, and that's a good thing. And uh, I think that there needs to always be a place for people like him in hardcore. Uh, but some songs are written just to fucking mosh, kick that shit. And we, and we, and we played uh, Firestorm. And it was like the most fun moment of like the whole run because it was just this insane, like the crowd just destroyed itself. Like they just right. started beating the snot out of each other and whatever. And it was just very funny that he, he had the presence of mind in that moment. He like, he's not, he's not a shy dude, but you know, he's like, you know, not a vocalist that is like me and being obnoxious on stage with a microphone every night. And so it was just very funny and like, very, like exactly what you're touching on is like mm -hmm. some, Sometimes it's appropriate to be the talky guy. Sometimes we are just here to have a good time. And right. like, I understand the value in both scenarios. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's funny that you bring this up because it's a, like, I was thinking like, if you don't ask, you won't get the potential of Firestorm. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, <coughs> to me, hardcore is like a little bit, um, I am just at an age where it's like the set ends and I'm like, okay, cool. And then it's like, thank I, you. I, I yeah, don't really want to do an uh like a, an encore like, that's always been there my are some bands yeah. that i'm like like i don't know i'm just i'm very much of the fact i'm like all right like that's it it's wrapped up but then some people were like start chanting and i'm like okay do they have something and then you know it's two or three songs and not just one so i don't know uh i've always I rolled my eyes at encores most all, i would say like 99 percent of the time i'm like come on dude that's yeah. rock star shit i think it's goofy um but in Prague, they did that. They like wouldn't let it go. And we were kind of like, we, I even said, I was like, we literally don't know anymore. Like, we're very flattered. Thank you. But like, mm -hmm. we don't have anything to play. Like, yeah, just we're come closed. At the come back group. tomorrow like, or at the next show. Yeah. 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 And it was New Year's Eve. So I was like, we're about to kick off New Year's Eve and where you got a karaoke party after this in the <laughs> venue. So like, just stick around for that. And sure, like, you know. Sure thank you for watching. We're called life force or whatever. Mm. And, um, we asked the, the band, there's this band that I highly recommend looking up from Europe called remain. They're a straight edge band. Okay. And we played a couple shows with them over there. And, um, we asked them after the show, we were like, what are you, what are we supposed to do in that situation? Cause like that we weren't expecting that. And they were like, play your set again. And we were like, what? They're like, yeah, <laughs> the that's whole a thing set here. Yeah, they were like, that's a thing here. People, they just play the whole thing twice. And I was like, no, there's no fucking way that's real. Like, you're definitely messing with the Americans. And they were like, no, that's a thing that people do is they'll play their set twice. And so yeah. we didn't do that. But I was like, I can't even imagine. Like, it just seems insane to me. I mean, like, my new band that played our, our first show just a few days ago, um, our set's only like nine minutes, so I wouldn't be too against just running it again because right. it's very right. like in and out. Uh, but it's the what's same the token. New, what's the new band? I want to hear the plug because I'm uh, it up. Well, it, it's funny that we're talking about all this like serious lyrical stuff because this band is total opposite to that. It's like intentionally like the most dummy shit ever. Um, but it's called Admission of Guilt um there's uh you know it went on streaming on the 3rd of january so i'll send it to you and okay. you can you know say it does not do your fancy and i will <laughs> not be offended at all um at the i'm playing guitar in that project but maybe this will be a subtle plug or tease um because you know that i play in another band called endgame um yeah and there is a bit of member swapping and stuff mm. for this next release so i am actually going to be um the one holding the mic and doing oh that cool going forward and so this conversation is helpful for me to be able to like really just like um 
not just write stuff that's like, oh, this is diss track number three, if you're kind of <laughs> looking at it um, that way. So, um, yeah, it's just yeah, a yeah. subtle thing for the people that are this deep in the episode that know those things about me. Um, yeah. But you've talked about Europe uh, a few times. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about, you know, to make sure that we utilize all our time here, Flint, is... Um, and this is always, again, the serendipity of we're going to do this interview prior to the tour and then at, and then we're like, oh, like right. things are a little busy. Let's do it after. One of the first clips I saw of you while on tour, you were introing a song and then the camera pans <laughs> and everyone looks to have mock shift like lightsabers of some kind yeah. and they're swinging them yeah. around and people are like throw. So for those that have not seen that video, can you break down some of the context like is this a Dude, wwe I, like light smashing sequence or is this just legitimately glow, giant glow still, i don't know <laughs> we weren't involved okay so that was in prague and the first show of the tour was new year's eve and we were like okay this is either gonna pop off or no one will come mm. like we weren't sure like you know because if you i think if you do a new year's eve show it's either going to be what people's plans for new year's eve as a holiday sure. are they're like yeah. i'm going to that show to ring in the new year or they're like fuck that i'm going out with my friends to yeah. ring in the new year i'm not going to a or, show or fuck it i'm staying at home and going to bed at 9 p.m because i'm an old oh. ass dude yes yes exactly <laughs> you know my vibe so yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, like i was like this it's either gonna go really well or really poorly and we didn't know what to expect now i knew it was it was at a venue the venue is called eternia in prague that is like the coolest space. Like I would kill another human being for a DIY space like this in every city in America, because it's God, dude, it's exactly what it should be. Like it's in the top floor of this like warehouse. The ground floor is a vegan restaurant called Eternia, E-A-T, like eating, oh. which I think is clever. Uh, the top okay. floor is the venue Eternia, like, like eternity. And um, you walk up like, all these stairs, like which we deduced, and I'm gonna put it out to you since you have a lot more connections than I do. If you've ever had a member of nothing on your show, ask them this. If you've never have, get one and ask them this because okay. I wanna know the answer to this. But Bobby, our drummer, who he's he's currently on tour playing drums for contention. Um, he plays drums in a new power violence band from Florida called Dogmatic. Um, good homie, he played drums on this tour, and um, he's a huge nothing fanboy. Hmm, and we're okay. walking up the staircase at this venue. This is a total aside. I'm sorry. I'm this no, guy, no, but whatever. No, um, we think the staircase in this venue is the staircase from the nothing artwork. Oh, the square. Okay. Because we were like, this is cool. We should take pictures in this staircase. Mm -hmm. And Bobby took a photo and he goes, oh shit. And he like pulls up the record. And I, I think it is. I think it has to be because it's like exactly the same stair, unless there's an identical staircase in like fucking philadelphia or something where they did it and it was simpler anyway that's a total aside but you're walking this huge like six floors of stairs and you walk in and there's a baywatch pinball machine a merch market a like bar top where they do like vegan food and drinks um a mini ramp like a little mini half pipe built into the room and they do the shows like in front of the mini ramp oh, on wow. the floor. Okay, yeah. And the PA is bolted into the rafters. So all the speakers are up off the floor. They're above everyone. So yeah. everyone can hear everything. I mean, it's like, it's the perfect DIY venue. So shout out Eternia because it was like, we walked in, we were like, oh my God. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we're in the space, we're practicing. Our, we've never played a set as a band like, at, with our fill-ins ever. We've all practiced individually. So we're at the venue and we're like, fuck you know stressed out yeah we're going through the set and we go through the set we we set up the back line and then we're kind of like all right well hope people come you know like i hope people start to show up mm -hmm. and so we're kind of like nervous like sitting around and people start to show up and then they just like keep showing up and keep showing up and so eventually there's like 150 250 kids in the room and it's like pretty packed and all the openers are solid as fuck and people are going off and we're like, okay, you know, like we're the headliner. So like, we got to bring it. And so um, I am myself. So I went into a little higher standards talk at the very beginning um, about what that song is about and who we are as a band. And at the end, I'm like, this band is called Life Force and this song is called Higher Standards. 
And it was like, I said that, and there was this like weird silent cue that we were not privy to. And like 50 dudes are like, oh, these <laughs> what? and it's insane, dude. And you can see, if you go watch the video, you can, we didn't know it was going to happen. And I still don't know why or how it happened. I don't know who brought them. I don't right. know how they got distributed without me noticing. I guess I was just stressed and like, but there's, and then they start moshing. So there's all these lifesavers being swung and breaking on people. And I'm like cracking up because it, like, you can see me just being like, what the fuck is going on? And of course they're all like life force blue. Like they're all like, of RV course. Colors. Yes. It would it's, be a shame like, if it was like purple or green or anything else. So I wish I could tell you, like, I really don't know. I think it has to be um, the Fluff Wheels crew, um, who that's who we rented our gear and our van from. Mm. I think it has to, it had to have been Tomas and them. Yeah. I but I really don't know. I ha I really have no idea. So it was like the, and it's so funny in that video, the one we posted, um, my wife was recording it. She sold merch on the tour and like right. tour managed for us. And um, you can hear her. She's like screaming into the camera report because she was just recording the set and, and she's like, oh my God, like cracking up the whole time. Right. Because it was just this off the wall moment. So yeah. yeah really I, I, I remember there. DMing you being like, what the fuck is this like Star Wars shit? And then I think you said like Coruscant straight edge or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. It was just like, I ha I honestly, I wish I knew. Um, I'm a big Star Wars geek, and mm -hmm. um, like as I'm weaving my waving my arms around, like Star Wars tattoos, Star Wars nerd shit behind me. So like, right. obviously I was psyched. Like we were fucking excited about it. And we thought it was hilarious. But I wish I wish I knew more information. So if anyone hears this and has the explanation, you know, yeah. let us know. Bunch of you got punked off of the 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 unintentional Star Wars uh, <laughs> lightsaber draw. Man, that's yeah, so funny. It was awesome. Um, it was so cool. Yeah, and I, you know, I per perused your Instagram a little bit before this, so you know, saw the Star Wars stuff. You know, obviously, you're you know, um, a sci-fi head. So a question that I have that is tying, you know, this is the perfect segue tying these two worlds together. Excellent. If you're looking right. at all, so this is not just Star Wars, so you don't even have to like consider that. But if you're looking, you know. You know, there's the rule of two on Star Wars. So, mm -hmm. you know, very familiar. For, yeah. For straight edge, it's the rule of three. There's three X's. Um, <laughs> if all other fantasy world fandoms, whatever you want to spin it, have to be ordered 67, annihilated, but you can keep three. What are the three things in within those worlds? So that's your Star Wars, Jurassic Park, Harry Potter. What are the three yeah, that stay? Yeah. Okay, so first I have to correct you. Uh, executing Order 66 is where everything gets eliminated. So well, all, that's Order 66 okay. is killing all the Jedi. Order 67 <laughs> is killing all of the creative stuff. Oh, got it. Okay, so I'm okay. correcting your correction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, in terms of like... Order 66 point version. Two, I don't know if you want to... 66.6. I, I can land point. there if, if, you're, if you're fine with that. Okay, so... I have to answer this in the same way that I answer the desert island question, which is, in my opinion, there's a difference between what I think is my favorite and that I enjoy the most and what I think is the most important to the genre. So, yeah, yes, because sorry, and I just want to interject because this it is similar to the desert island. Like, what would you take? But the, uh, to in this scenario the world still keeps going on. So you have to consider if okay. I if I ax this, is there going to be a revolution because this fandom is so toxic that it's going to like <laughs> cause a, a world war? So that, that's the only other stuff before I allow you to say your picks. If we're keeping it sci-fi broad, I think like sci-fi is just a type of high fantasy. And I think that doesn't ever really get talked about unless you're talking to book nerds or like you're on booktube and you're like watching this shit constantly, which I am. So um, I expand sci-fi to include certain high fantasy properties, right? Um, and I think that sci-fi as like a genre or whatever, if that's what the question is specifically pertain pertaining to, it you have to say that like the Lord of the Rings universe had to exist for 
any of the following shit to occur that has to stay because it's like the keystone right yes Mm -hmm. like the foundational stone of of the whole genre um similarly um because it has been shamelessly ripped um and it's so foundational to what now everyone associates with sci-fi tropes and with like um what is what makes that genre what it is whether you're talking literature or movies um the dune series has to be included so oh, okay interesting yeah did not yeah, expect um, that but i to your credit a lot of star wars stuff was clearly inspired by dune so i so that's... interestingly i don't include star wars in the three yes i i, I don't if, if um, we're I, being completely honest like i know there's things like andor and mandalorian but like if we're looking at the like I love George Lucas and everything that he did right now. It's in a state of disarray. So if, yeah. you know, nuclear, nuclear, um, annihilation is the only option that might have to hit the chopping block for me as well. I, I think it has to go, but it's not because it's not good. And that's why I brought up the, the discrepancy of like favorite versus important. Right. Because like, like I love bold the mm-hmm. band. I love, I love that band. I know bold, from a technical musical standpoint is like not good. I understand that. Like it's a, it was a bunch of 16 year olds that could like barely play their instruments. I love the music. I'm not going to pretend that it's the height of, of hardcore music writing. I understand there's a difference between the two. You know what I mean? So like, that's kind of how I feel about star Wars. Like I love star Wars and it's like, I'm surrounded by the memorabilia and I'm whatever. I can acknowledge it's got some weaknesses and I can also acknowledge it pretty shamelessly ripped a lot of what was important from properties like Dune and that a lot of what makes Star Wars good is actually what made Dune good first. So that's why I, I would say Dune is probably more important personally Okay. for the, for the genre moving into the rest of time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the third one is my curveball. And it is uh, a plug of a series that I doesn't, I think does not get enough love. And um, I'm doing the books, but it has been, it's been slowly making its way into multimedia, kind of like Dune. Um, But uh, I think that Stephen King's Dark Tower is the third answer. Okay. Um, And there is a reason, and it's because it, the Dark Tower is the, is the common thread. It's the common through line of all of King's work. So every one of King's stories in some way is attached to the Dark Tower um, as sort of like a magnum opus of his work that then it might be like four or five branches off, but in every way, um, all of his work. And he's probably like the most prolific, um, you know, fantasy, sci-fi and horror writer of our era. And um, he he created this, this piece, this work, this singular work that's like in cut into however many volumes, um, that it like touches high fantasy. It touches sci-fi. It touches Western. It touches horror. It touches romance. It touches like every literary fiction genre pretty seamlessly while also being fucking weird and like wacky and good so it's like this kind of like it shouldn't be good but it is and it's like incredible it's like my favorite book series of all time Hmm. um so i think you have and he basically wrote it he started it when he was 19 because he read lord of the rings and he read lord of the rings was like i'm going to write my lord of the rings Hmm. like my universe's epic and he started the gunslinger the first book when he was 19 and it's funny because he finished it like way later in life he, he finished the last book way later and you can tell like he matured as an individual and as a writer and it's this kind of beautiful creative process that created this story that is like a timeless incredible story so if you haven't read it i really highly recommend it yeah um and i do have an honorable mention too um which is um robert jordan's wheel of time um, oh yeah wheel of time I, it's That's a great. sci-fi but a lot of people don't no, it's sci-fi. They think it's fantasy. Um, mm. but it turns out if you read it, spoiler warning or whatever, um, it is, it's actually just set way far in the future of humanity and it's, ta- it takes place on earth, but it's, it's like tens of thousands of years in the future. Mm. And, um, it's, it's this kind of like post-apocalypse scenario where it's like 
we've reverted to almost like a like a medieval vibe, but it's it's actually in the future or whatever. But incredible series, very very good. Do you fuck with the the Amazon adaptation of that? Cautiously, I liked it. I mean, I thought it was fun. Um, I think they were really heavily underfunded, which sucks. Um, like the budget that went into the Lord of the Rings show, which in my opinion was shit, um, should have been going to wheel of time because like, we don't kind of like star Wars. Like I don't need that Lord of the Rings show. It doesn't need to exist. And it's like written in a way that I hate. And I just, there's no reason for it to be there, but it's beautiful. And it's this like gorgeous production, Mm -hmm. uh, wheel of time needs to be made and it needs to be told in a multimedia format and it's like kind of ugly so it's like sucks like it should have it should have been right the it should have been the favorite child of that era's of, of amazon's production it wasn't um i think it's fine i think covid uh definitely like made it limp a lot because one of the main actors quit and it was covid related and they had to keep canceling shoots because of covid and all this bullshit so i'm holding out for seasons two and three to be like really good i think season one was like growing pains hopefully yeah Yeah. like i think the at least that was the first intro for me i was like oh like i'm i'm very interested in the story but like you know um contextually there was like certain moments where it felt like lacking you know could have used a little bit more but yeah like a lot of shows that came out during the months that we're all stuck at home and all those people are out trying to shoot in the safest safest ways possible and obviously like running into hiccup after hiccup like i i give a lot of grace to those people right and hold out to for the the seasons to come but aside from your honorable mention i only expected one of those answers um so oh nice okay cool cool i would also because i corrected your correction but um (sighs) Jordan is now correcting my correction to your correction. So Order 67, as Wikipedia states, is um, appeared in the 2022 video game Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga. And originally in the Robot Chicken Star Wars clip is where Palpatine is shown falling down the shaft and calls. Um, oh, wait, I am I reading the right? Oh, here. I need to scroll. So Order 67 was order requiring clone troopers to begin dancing. During the Battle of Utapah, <laughs> Darth Sidious accidentally executes Order 67 when he meant to use Order 66 just after he was executed. So that was, I appreciate bringing the lore back up to the top. And, uh, yes. you know, as as it it, it it all ends, the producer is always right. So, Jordan, thanks for adding that. Yeah, we got the man in the wings who knows everything. Yeah, I love it. it's like we have a shared doc and I get this link pops up and it's highlighted. And I'm like, oh, I've. So, you got, you got actually moment it was an actually- yes it was an actual gotcha moment um <laughs> well flint like we're two hours in this combo and i'm sure that we could go for another two if we really wanted to but i want to be sensitive of your time um the chat with you has been phenomenal and i haven't used that word i don't think for any other interview that i've done for this podcast and i truly oh wow it. well thanks man that's cool i appreciate it um the last question i asked every single person before we start to wrap up is a favorite mosh related story and that could be wholesome gruesome <laughs> funny barbaric um could have happened to you or just at a show you're attending whatever's the first thing off the top of your head uh okay so the the one that is like the very first one that pops in my head is probably the best um so in my younger days um and my i have a younger brother um who's also just rolled over into his 30s. So he's not really a baby brother anymore. But um, when we were in high school, he, it, just like most younger brothers, um, was, you know, like, oh, what are you into? Cool. I'm going to tag along. That's also what I'm going to be into. So he came to a lot of hardcore shows. And um, once I moved out and um, he kind of had the freedom to, like, make up his own mind, he got into other shit. And he's not really a hardcore kid at all now. He's more of just like normie dad guy, but um, he uh, would come to shows and um, I'm uh, like six foot two. Um, I've, I've been like six foot two since, I don't know, like freshman year probably. And um, always been bigger than he was. Um, so like six to 200 ish pounds, pretty much my whole life, my whole adult life. And um, he is, I think he's like five, seven, 
maybe a little shorter, um, smaller in stature. Um, but the kicker is that he's redheaded and he has this like incredible redhead superpower that they have um, where they can just go into berserker mode, right? <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's been a thing our whole lives. And it's like, you know, when we would fist fight as kids or whatever, like it was always like his, con- it, there was a contention in place for like, okay, if he goes into rage mode, you got to know how to deal with it or whatever. Right. Yeah. And um, when we first got into hardcore, like a lot of younger dudes with too much testosterone, we got in a lot of fights and we were always having these altercations and like shows pit beef would turn into fights in the parking lot and whatever bullshit like young hardcore dudes do and um now looking back i can roll my eyes and be like that's fucking goofy and i should have known better but at the time you know you're fucking 16 years old you don't know any better and um we were we were at a show at a local diy spot and um this venue was kind of in a place where it brought there's this kind of small town, not even really a suburb, like like a rural community that had bands and they had like their own kind of, it was more of like, yeah, like Pantera, fuck yeah, type vibe. Mm. But they would sometimes, it would draw people from that scene who like kind of didn't know what was going on. And like, they were just kind of like, yeah, I like to, I like to mosh. And it's like, you don't really know anything, but like, sure. And, um, we're at a show. I couldn't even tell you who was playing. It was a local band. And um, I'm moshing. And uh, I guess I swung on like one of the wrong people uh, that was on the side of the crowd. He was one of these kind of like country dudes. And um, I popped him and he fell down. And his brother, who was also at the show, um, didn't like that, older brother. And he came over and started trying to swing on me, but I was like, not what I wasn't paying attention. I was like looking at the band and like moshing or whatever. This and, is not um, swinging so to the music anymore. This is intentional swinging at you. This is like, I'm going to fuck that blonde dude up who just hit my brother, you know? <laughs> sure. like, so, so this kind of like, I don't really know. I don't know anything about the guy, but he, I guess didn't know what was going on. And he was being a good brother and was like, I'm going to go take this dude out. So he comes at me and he's swinging on me, but I'm like moshing. So I don't know what's happening. And I see fists coming and I just move. Cause I'm like, Oh, someone's moshing behind me. Like, sure. So I yeah. just like get out of the way. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know, like two step in my way away and uh, like moving across the pit and he's missing and getting angrier and angrier <laughs> as he's missing. And I'm not engaging, which is also making him angrier. And um, my brother I turn around and I'm and I notice there's this dude like squaring up at me. Mm. And I'm kind of like, oh shit, I'm in a fight. And I like didn't know what was happening, or whatever. And um, I kind of like take a step back and kind of square up. And this blur like whoosh is through frame. And um, it was my little brother who at this time, like five, six, maybe, maybe like 140 pounds soaking wet, <laughs> like a little dude. Um had started running from like across the venue and haymakered this poor country dude that was just trying to defend his brother. <laughs> but he like jumping, flying punch haymakered this guy wow. at like full speed. And <laughs> the dude, the, Very, it like, was like, if, if this was an anime, like there would just be like lines to show lines, how crazy yeah, <laughs> yeah. of him just like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he jumps and just lays the guy like really hard, way harder than was necessary. And the dude gets knocked out. Like it knocks him out and he falls like a ton of bricks mm-hmm. and he hits the floor hard. And I'm like laughing because I'm like, oh my God, dude. like <laughs> get, this is insane. And so my brother has flown across my field of vision and taken this dude out. Well, the brother that I initially hit is still there. He's like behind his... so. He, what he has seen, he has seen a guy hit him. He's turned and watched his brother get knocked the fuck out cold. And so then he's like, absolutely not. He's bowing up. Right. So he wa- he goes to step to my little brother, who then I'm like, okay, now I have to be big brother. And I stick him once, like pretty hard. This is a and battle of the brothers. <laughs> I know. So I clock the guy, like bridge of nose hit, like not hard enough to do real damage, but it's his eyes water. He sits down, he's out for the count or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so me and my brother are kind of standing in the, and you know, when people fight, there becomes like the, the ring and it's this awkward, the band is still playing. Everyone's kind of like, oh shit. 
And so me and my brother are standing and there's these two other brothers on the ground that are like sufficiently <laughs> fucked up on the floor. And we're kind of just like, oh, awkward moment, whatever. So that's like the story or whatever that you asked for. Right. There is an there is a postscript to the story. Oh, uh, I'm, like I'm for five it. years. Five years down the line, I am a server. I'm in school. I'm a server at TGI Fridays and I'm waiting tables and I'm like at work. I'm in work mode. I'm fucking hustling my appetizers or whatever the fuck. And I come over, I get a two top. I come to the table and it's a date and um, it's a guy and a girl out on the town. And um, I give them my little spiel. Like, how's it going guys? I'll be your server. My name's Flint. Um, can I get you started with a fucking iced tea or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I have a book, like I'm writing orders in or whatever. And I, I take the girl's order and I'm like, okay, yeah, right, coming right up. And I turn and I look and it's one of the brothers. Um, it's the first time we've seen each other since me and my brother like, beat the <laughs> shit out of him and his brother. And I had, I like kind of forgot he existed, you know, it was like an isolated incident. And I never saw those dudes again. They of course never came to a show, which sucks, you know, like whatever. They never came back. Yeah. Um, so I haven't seen this. So, guy since. so you realize it immediately at the moment. I don't realize it when I walk up to the table, but and, when you but locked when eyes with him, you were like, Oh, like, we have thrown fists at one another. Yeah. Like I beat, I hit you so hard in the face. You fell down and were, and like, couldn't see, right. Like, <laughs> at a certain point and i realize who he is and he's looking up and he realizes who i am and the exact moment is i'm like what can i get you man and he looks up and goes uh i'll just take a coke and oh, you can tell no. it's like a it's like a moment of like i don't know for sure because i didn't address it i acted like i didn't know him but right i don't know if he's like if it's an embarrassment moment or if it's like a, I'm afraid of this dude. Cause the last time I saw him, he hurt me, you know? And then, so it's like a normal Could reaction. Could you imagine like, oh. in the minute you just throw your book and you're like, well, you ready for round two motherfucker. <laughs> Let's go. Motherfucker. Yeah. Uh, no. And I felt so bad dude, because he's on a date with this girl and like, He's, you know, like, yeah, baby, let's go to Fridays. Yeah, I got right. your dinner, no problem. And he sits down and then he goes through this transformation of like, he's cowed and he's like, just a Coke, thank you. Yeah. And like, won't look me in the eye and he's very uncomfortable. Oh, man. And I felt fucking terrible, dude. I, I, what, I didn't get a victory lap at all. I felt <laughs> like a piece of shit completely because I was like, damn, that sucks that that guy feels that way. So I don't even know the dude's name, but. Shout out the two country brothers from Guthrie, Oklahoma. <laughs> it's like that out. meme of like the the girl laying in bed, like he's probably thinking about other girls and he's thinking about <laughs> that specific moment. <laughs> I just hope that like, I don't know, man. I hope that it's not, it like hasn't stuck with him in some way. Like right. it mortifies me to be that character. Cause like when I was like brawling constantly and I was before it was pre-therapy and I didn't know how to deal with my emotions, I was picking fights regularly with like sure. grown men at shows and like putting myself in dangerous situations I should never have put myself in. And at one point I, I was, I was fighting two dudes at the same time and I lost and it was not good. And I was like fucked up from it. And I like, look back at that. Like that was a turning point for me. I should have known better. And like, I am embarrassed of being that guy. And so then now I think about like, dude, does that country brother think about that shit? Like, does he <laughs> think back like me and Cletus should not have been at that show or whatever? Like, right. I don't know. I, I it's just it's like, like those, yeah, um, that's probably those drawings of like, oh, uh, like, can you describe the the person, you know, if someone's talking to the cops, like, can you describe the person from the incident? And then it's like this very mixed. <laughs> it's like that is on his his bathroom wall. And he's like, yeah, fucking, you know, <laughs> it's like one day I'm going to see that day. albino motherfucker. <laughs> And I'm gonna find, I'm gonna get my revenge. Um, very obviously contextually, like you know, uh, you learned a lot from that, and you know, hopefully, if there's any chance in hell this person hears that, you know, obviously, if there's, <laughs> you know, like the shit just kind of happens out of hand at shows, and you know, like yeah. I think a lot of us um, that find ourselves in those situations, like yeah, th that shit was stupid, but like you know, to to your credit, like some people. It's their first ever hardcore show and then they just get caught at the wrong place wrong time they don't understand that like this is the way that we do things and shit happens blah 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 but um 
that story is so funny to me and something that I'm working on. Again, this is a little tease because um, I like to connect all these things in, in my world. Um, this whole mosh story segment has been in every single episode of, of the podcast that I've done. And something that I'm hopefully going to be bringing at some point this year is I want to have a like an animator or like a graphics person, <laughs> like very like not like full on stick man, but like very simplistic um like storyboard it out yeah. yes exactly and you know to be able to because that was um uh something that i grew up with through another um creative endeavor where they would ha have a podcast and they would tell all these like you know whether it was a party story or a drunk story or just a very awkward interaction at a, at a jersey mics and they would like make this whole like um animated adventures is what they called it and so that I'm like, sounds fucking fantastic you know yeah. obviously there's stuff from the podcast with like the fucking you know star wars lightsaber that i'm like oh that's definitely one <laughs> this like us talking about the fucking anime running like that that's <laughs> cut to it so you know hopefully that'll be coming down the pipe sooner than later i'm just i think i found the dude who's down to do it and we are gonna start you know trialing that out and see if that's yo if if that happens at some point, I reserve the right to invite my normie ass brother, who's now <laughs> a very mild mannered father and like well adjusted and is completely divorced from hardcore in any way. I reserve the right to blindly have him on and show him that clip because that Dude. would be so funny yeah once we're like in the process of like animating you like i might need to get like a family <laughs> photo with him as well so <laughs> just for a yeah that's point. fantastic i love it i love that idea I um love it. dude flint again this has been a fantastic conversation uh all the life force stuff all of the varsity jacket stuff and your personal links will be in the description and in the show notes anyone you want to shout out anything you want to send the people off with or anything you want to end on uh yeah so um we were lucky enough to do that, the Euro run, and it um, unexpectedly opened a lot of uh, new doors. And so um, we have a lot of plans in the works right now. I can't like really um, give detail on some of it, um, but it's kind of what in the vein of what we're talking about. We have an offer on the table to go back to Europe um, with a huge band um, that's very different from us. And so um, that... I don't know if it's going to happen, um, but if it does, it'll put my message and our messaging in front of a lot of ears that have probably never been exposed to stuff like that before. And mm. it's like, I was very hesitant at first. Um, and then um, uh, just talking to people who I look up to and I respect um, and kind of getting a feel for like, is this a good move for us and for us? I think we're going to do it. So um, anyways, keep an eye out for that if that happens. Um, and um, I'd like to obviously shout out New Age um, and everything that they do for us and continue, have done, continue to do. Um, Mike, the owner, is a fucking awesome dude. So um, thank you to him for everything that he did and has done, continues to do. And um, uh, keep an eye out for us. I think we're going to be doing runs soon. We're doing like Southern California. We're doing um, the Northeast, probably doing Canada. So um, that's that's in the books hopefully um we'll see it might be centered around festival appearances and stuff like that so it just depends on how that works out sure. so um i'll connect with you offline about it or whatever oh, but yes. um, yeah we'll be around so if if anyone that sees this wants to come tell me the shit that i had to say was wrong or whatever <laughs> please feel free and co come to a show i'm more than welcome it yeah i'll yeah, chat yeah. with anybody I'm yeah excited. highly I'm... highly recommend uh wherever life force is popping popping up this year to go check them out um one of my favorite uh sets from prom core when i when i saw you guys for the first time and dude again this is definitely deserves for you to come back on the podcast at, at a much right. later date but this was a blast i can't wait to put this out and thank you so much for joining us yeah, thank you for having me, man. I really appreciate it.